Hello, welcome to the Goodness for an evening talking about Catholicism and the issues of the world. But um, without really any introduction other than the critical witness, and we talk about big questions uh, for about an hour and a half a month. Uh, you can catch some podcast things. That's who we are. I'm Phil. Dan is my co-host. We're introducing Peter D. Williams this week, as opposed to the Peter S. Williams from last week. And <laughs> no, was it Peter? Peter J. Peter J. J. Peter J. J. There's a Peter week. S. Williams. Oh my goodness! We had Peter J. Williams and the Gospels last week, a couple weeks ago. And there's a Peter S. Williams out there who we might have on just to confuse me even more. Peter, welcome. Uh, Thank you. It's great to have you. I haven't officially met other than just before we went live. So it'd be great to get to know you a little bit. Tell us a bit about yourself, um, why you're a Christian, maybe even why you're a Catholic, if you can do that in the first five minutes. Um, and we'll we'll go from there. Wow. I mean, I remember, I'm remember i reminded of uh, G.K. Chesterton's comment that uh, the reason why I'm a Catholic can be boiled down to, you know, many thousands of reasons boiled down to one reason, which is that Catholicism is true. Uh, and I think the same thing is true of, of Christianity, but the most... We might get into this later about uh, what constitutes a cause of something, because that comes into uh, the whole issue of justification. Uh, so I'll whet your appetite with that. But uh, often when we talk about uh, why am I something, um, I think we're talking about what caused it. And what caused me to be a Christian uh, is quite simply the grace of God, um, his action in my life. And if we're talking about how that came about instrumentally, how, how um, that came out in my life, I was baptised as, as an infant. So, of course, theologically, uh, I would say that that's when I became a Christian. But when it came to a, a personal faith, when it came to something which was a, a true conviction of Christ. That came rather later. Um, I went from having a quite childish you know, faith when I, was, when I was a child to then falling into a kind of um, lazy atheism. I say lazy atheism. It was, it was atheism because it was convenient, but it was an atheism because I thought if there's no God, uh, then there's no ultimate consequence to anything I do. Brilliant. I can do what I like. Um, and that's a perfectly consistent, uh, decent reason for being an atheist. Um, and I think that I liked the idea of there being effectively a moral, morally nihilistic universe. But the more I thought about it, the more I became interested in moral issues, political issues, which have continually been um, a preoccupation for me. Uh, I came to the conclusion that, no, there needs to be a standard and there needs to be um, a transcendent, universal, intrinsic, objective, absolute set of moral norms for anything to make any kind of prescriptive sense, we're going to have debates about morality and plot politics. And I felt that on a on an instinctive level and on a, a visceral level, I believe that there was such a thing as good and evil. Now, later on, I would I would have you know, justified that in terms of what I call the not what I call, but what is called the natural law. But at the time, I didn't I hadn't gone that far. I just came to the conclusion that, no, there must be a, a transcendent set of moral norms. And the only way that made sense is if there was a transcendent source of that and that led me to theism that led me to believe in that god exists and the kind of christianity the kind of religion i knew at the time which was theistic was christianity and specifically catholic so i just accepted that at the time um and then rebelled against it, it sort of as a little heretic in various different ways i was very in favor of legalized abortion very radically so i was very um in favor of uh, you know the standard views in the 90s and, and noughties and now on homosexuality and things like that. But every single time I looked into the issues on which I rebelled against the church and rebelled against uh, the teaching of Christ, I, I U-turned. I kept on coming back to, to orthodoxy. And it became it came to a point where I fell in love um, with orthodoxy. The romance of orthodoxy, the romance of truth, really took my heart by God's grace. Um, and so I don't, I mean, I could, I could go further on this, but I'll just sort of cut it short by saying that eventually having read through the, the arguments for God's existence and having come to conclusions, orthodox conclusions on morality, uh, including life issues. I then went to university. I met uh, people from other Christian traditions, uh, Protestant Christian traditions in particular, and uh, had wonderful debates with them. That's what university should be for, actually having brilliant in-depth debates with people with whom you don't agree, but you don't quite know why the why you disagree. And so I, I 
read through those issues and came became more and more and more passionately Catholic. And it was at university that I sh I properly came back to the faith by returning to the sacrament of confession, having a consistent, more consistent uh, Catholic Christian life. And the more and more and more I've learned, the more and more I, I fell in love with it and fell in love with Christ, with his truth and with the church. So that in a nutshell, <laughs> in five minutes, is why I'm really a done. Catholic. I think but it ultimately is on the dot. Christ. So, I mean, we, we first, I think we first met quite quite a few years ago. We did a debate, a uh, pro-life debate down at Brighton Medical School, wasn't it, I think? But I think we may, we probably met before that, actually. Mm. Um, so what, what um, you know, tell me, I guess, from the from the Roman Catholic view, like, um, I guess, you know, like I write a lot of um, sort of academic stuff on around sort of bioethics and, and abortion and other sort of early life ethics things. Uh, and, and, and most of the... Um, I'd say most of the the, the the best sort of Christian defenders uh, from, you know, especially from a Christian and um, a Christian philosophical view tend to be Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, so people like Christopher Kazor, um, Francis Beckwith, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, there are some exceptions, uh, but, but largely, um, you know, I, I would say the, the best defenders from that, from the Christian worldview are, are Roman Catholics. So why, you know, why is that? And what, um, you know, from your from your perspective, like what is the the case against abortion um, for for life uh, from from a Roman Catholic point perspective? Well, I mean, this is this is one of those areas where I think it depends on a lot of your background presuppositions. Because I mean, obviously, I would say that the case against abortion isn't actually a Catholic case at all. Uh, the Catholic case against abortion is effectively the natural law case. And the natural law case is based on the idea that there are moral norms within the purposes of our human nature, the fulfillment of which constitute human flourishing. And when you come to that conclusion, you come to another conclusion, which is that there are these things called natural rights. So if the idea, uh, the very purpose of our, of our nature is to flourish, if we have all these purposes of our nature, whether it be our, our um, purpose to eat, which is to engage in nutrition for our bodies, whether it be to the, the purpose of our thinking, which is to think clearly and truthfully about things, the purpose of our speech is to speak truthfully to others in social communication. And when you come to the conclusion as to the, uh, the purpose of our life is to effectively flourish in the fulfillment of all of these purposes so that we flourish as human beings, it leads you to another conclusion, which is that if you have a duty to flourish in your moral actions, that's how you know what is right and wrong, whether you are fulfilling these purposes within your nature. That also entails that other people have a duty not to frustrate your flourishing. And that means, of course, that you have a right, let's say, their duty not to attack you, uh, maim you, or even indeed murder you. And that is the base of what we call the natural right to life. Now, that's true of every single being that, can, that has a human nature. Um, and therefore, it's true of every single human being from conception onwards. And that was the, the fundamental reason why we would disagree with abortion. Now, you, you could be a Muslim and agree with that. You could be Jewish and agree with that. You could be any kind of Christian and agree with that. Or you could be non-religious at all. I think that the, the metaphysics behind that idea of the natural law would lead you to the conclusion, no, that God exists. It's the same, it's the same basic metaphysical worldview that gives us Western civilization classically. But you could potentially be someone who accepts the natural law, doesn't actually have a religious viewpoint or, or particular religion, but nonetheless is there for anti-abortion, which is the phrase I prefer. I, I prefer it to pro-life because I think the pro term pro-life, like the term pro-choice, is, is nebulous. It doesn't, it doesn't really tell you anything useful. Whereas anti-abortion tells you exactly what you're about. You're against this Absolutely. thing, the killing of, of innocent human beings. So I, I'm passionately against pro-life as a phrase, but I do believe um, that anyone of goodwill who is going to follow the logic consistently will have to recognize and not just the the, the logic but the, the evidence will have to recognize the humanity of unborn children will have to recognize that every human being has natural rights by virtue of the natural law and that therefore the killing of any innocent human being from conception till natural death is therefore evil wrong um, and the law exists to protect people from precisely those kind of lethal attacks so that in a nutshell again is why i'm anti-abortion and why I think everyone should be. Um, hmm. So, what, why yeah. is it the Roman Catholics are kind of led led the way, in, like well, sort of the early sort of Christian Church? I mean, because there have been other, uh, you know, um, you know, philosophical beliefs, you know, Greek, certain Greek uh, philosophers and things that you know, uh, adhere to sort of natural argue for natural law. Um, hmm. But why why is it that uh, what is it about Roman Catholic Roman Catholicism in um, you know in itself that lends itself to to being anti-abortion? 
you know is that something that's in the bible or it's a very interesting question uh i do think it is implicitly in the bible um that you could argue you could debate about certain texts which might describe the humanity of the unborn child or the evil of abortion but i, th I think that the, the strongest case is really that no one would have engaged in abortion in the, the scriptural era. It would have been seen as completely um, unthinkable to do that, precisely because of the scriptural view of fertility, for one thing, but also the scriptural view, again, of, of human life. And so consequently, I think it's more because if you're asking why do Catholics have such a strong opposition to abortion, almost not uniquely, but pr most profoundly, out of all the different different Christian traditions. I would say it's a magisterial thing. Uh, in other words, the Catholic Church magisterially, that is to say by its teaching authority, has been extremely strong against the injustice of abortion. And because there isn't that analogous magisterial power within, for example, Protestant ecclesial communities, um, or even as much within the Eastern non-Catholic churches, so-called Eastern Orthodoxy or Oriental Orthodoxy or Assyrian Church of the East, which do have a magisterium of sorts, but it's cert not certainly not as... Um, unified in certain ways or as or as powerful uh, in many ways. Uh, I think that because of the nature of the Catholic magisterium, her teaching authority, that's why um, the, the, ch the church's opposition to abortion has been so profound and therefore has formed the orthodox members of her communion. And that's why we've been leading the way on, on this point. And of course, our Protestant brothers and sisters have also joined in um, but have not been as strong historically. I mean, there was a, a very mixed view, a group of views within Protestantism in the 1960s, 70s, and then late 70s to 80s, you find actually more Protestants, certainly in America, become very strongly anti-abortion. Interesting enough in England, I mean, I get the, the sense from my Protestant friends that are, shall we say, not as conservative as, as other Protestants, um, that they're actually fairly ambigu um, ambivalent towards abortion. Uh, I'd like to see you know, more Protestants in England, um, well, in Great Britain, in, in the United Kingdom, become much more with us on this point and, and just and fight with us. Because I think that's a sleeping giant. I really do. I think there are so many passionately Christian people who, if they were better formed, morally speaking, uh, not only in terms of the metaphysics of morals, but in the historic Christian tradition, and were with us on the, the humanity of the unborn child and the horror that is abortion. Because, I mean, this is it, the, when you actually know what abortion involves, which most people do not, most people do not know what it involves, then I can't see how you can possibly be anything other than absolutely appalled by it and, and angry against it uh, and campaign against it as a profound injustice. So, yeah, that would be my answer, I think. It would be the, the nature of the magisterium. Yeah, I mean, there are, I, I'd say, you know, I think Protestants are, are, are certainly, or... Again, even Protestants, uh, I'd say more evangelicals. I think I'm probably more comfortable just in the sense that um, I, I think most most Protestants are not necessarily um, not thinking themselves as a, a movement in opposition to Roman Catholicism, but as something yeah. separate. Um, yeah. So I say evangelicals, you know, I think they're, you know, some like Andrew Stevenson and what they're doing, even though I know you would agree, not not agree with the with the methods, but someone like uh, uh, CBR and, and Abort 67 and those kinds of things is largely an ev evangelical movement that's def definitely growing. Um, yeah. I, w I would say as well in the sort of um, academic philosophy and, and bioethics, there's a... Um, a lot more evangelical philosophers and ethicists now who are very active academically, uh, um, you know, who are explicitly anti-abortion, like you said, and not just defending a, a sort of loose or pro, pro-life view. Yeah. Um, hmm. yeah, definitely. Well, I, becoming... think, I think it's very unhelpful. The whole pro-life thing, I think is deeply unhelpful. Yeah. We, we yeah. use, we use the term anti-abortion, uh, mm. as, as well. Mm. We're, we're getting some reports that people are having issues uh receiving this on their screens let me just check um youtube while we're just talking i'll be interested because uh, there are a lot of people who sort of it's, it's balancing or struggle to balance the care, care for the woman with the care for the unborn and generally you get to extremes of uh whether the rape, case of rape or the um unwanted or the, the pressures on the woman mm. and so i know several uh christians that I, I would talk to about this and they would prioritize in many ways in, in a sense so if i was to preach 
a talk about the sanctity of life, pointing to the image of God. Um, touching on abortion would wouldn't go down well because the statistics are likely that there's someone in the church who yes, has had one. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess there's a couple of questions in there. How how would you encourage people within the church to better approach that? So it's finding that balance because I find like a bought 67 and, and things like that. I actually find so aggressive. It's off putting. Um, hmm. Yeah. No, I, have I, you, how have you come across on that? Well, I mean, I, I do agree. I, I'm well known as someone who doesn't agree with the tactic of bought 67 of showing pictures of aborted fetuses outside of abortion facilities. Uh, and in other public places, mainly because I think that the it, there, there's a certain naivety that thinks that if you show people the truth, they will see the truth. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. People, I mean, this is this is one of the noetic effects of sin, as as it says, in, as it's known in theology. In other words, the the mental effect of sin is that people's minds have become darkened. And if you show them the truth, they won't necessarily accept it. What they will do is say, "This makes me feel bad." I therefore feel bad and therefore uh, I'll reject what you have to say. I won't even think about it. And you, you're right. That can be the case in church settings as well, I'm, I guess, where if you say something just very bluntly, uh, people will not necessarily accept it. They'll say, this makes me feel bad. I feel judge or I think I have friends or family who this implicitly judges. And therefore, I just I just won't even think about what you have to say. Um, we just have to realize that people are not always rational. And I say this as someone who was convinced from being incredibly pro-abortion to being radically anti-abortion within 10 minutes of seeing the picture of an aborted fetus because I'd never really considered that reality properly and that forced me to but that was because a it was in an academic setting and b because I'm a frankly I'm a bloke um and, and I was a teenage bloke as well so this is something I hadn't really considered before and men are more visual creatures and so consequently that was an effective means of reaching me at that point in my life and given my nature I don't think that's necessarily true of, of of all women, particularly who have often thought about this already, who have considered this, right, um, and have nonetheless come to the view that is more convenient for them if they're in favour of, of abortion. So I think it doesn't necessarily affect them in the same way. But so I'm not saying, therefore, I don't agree with that kind of tactic. I'm saying there is a time and a place, and I don't think it's in public or in public spaces. But regards to what you think of that, if we're if we're trying to say how do we reach Christians, um, I would say that has to be a, a matter within the church itself. So in other words, if you're a pastor of whatever kind, whether you are a Catholic priest or whether you are um, a minister in a Protestant ecclesial community, then what you need to do is inform your flock of, of, of what the reality of this is. Um, invite someone and say, okay, we're going to talk about a sensitive topic. It's a difficult topic, but it's something that we need to consider as Christians because we need to think about this in a way that honors God uh, and is rooted in divine revelation and in reason, and therefore, let's have a let's let's discuss this. You know, let's not cover this up. Let's not shove it under the carpet. Let's actually discuss this in a way that is charitable and calm and loving, but also straightforward and truthful. The the balance of charity and and verity, uh, charity and truth. And if you do that, then I think that if you form people. In other words, if you show them what the reality of abortion is, you show them the humanity of the unborn child, you show what the implications are, yes, of holy scripture and the sacred tradition, but also of reason itself to, and, and science, um, then you can say, okay, you, you will have informed people. Now, they still may not accept it because, again, of those that the noetic effects of sin, but you will have given them the, the best chance. And in lieu of, um, of, a, of a magisterium, if you like, I think that Protestants have at least um, the force of Holy Scripture, the force of hopefully the consistent Christian tradition, although that's not as uh, as readily known or as accepted. And certainly reason and science are universal things people can accept, re regardless of, of where they're coming from on a religious level. Um, not a perfect solution, but it's certainly the best one that we can do. There needs to be better education is the simple, simple answer. I agree with that. Uh, before we get in... in into the like the weeds of there's quite a few things theologically that I'm, I'm already uh, lining up to to chat about um, given the title of the the clip uh, the video and the stream but just just to go into that I'd just be interested in your response so one of the main um, sort of pro abortion uh, arguments is based on the assumption of um, personhood and the sort of separation of 
well, they might be human, but they're not yet a person. Hmm. Um, I'll be wondering if you just what would be your what is your response to that? Because I, I imagine you've, or, or, <laughs> I know you've come across that argument already. Hmm. But I'll just be wondering: Do you have like a, a summary of why that view is flawed? Uh, I'd just be interested. Yeah, I mean, I I try to cut the knot of that moral dualism um, by simply going for the, the natural law. Um, the the great thing about the natural law is that it talks about humanity. It doesn't talk about personhood. Personhood is really a quite late invention, really. Um, you, you have a situation in which people talk about there are human beings that are persons uh, and there are human beings that are not persons. Well, why? why? Why do we assert this? Why do we think that there are some human beings that are not personal in some way? They, they have a human nature. That human nature has all these purposes and therefore that gives them rights. So I cut the Gordian knot. Uh, I just talk about humanity, the natural law and therefore natural lights and it flows from there. But if someone insists on in, on saying, no, 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 there are some human beings that are not persons. I say, okay, well, what's your, what's your basis for that? And they'll usually fall back on something like, well, a person has free will, reason, um, mm -hmm. has consciousness, uh, all those sorts of things that, that effectively are the the properties or capacities of an, a human being. And I'd say, well, the problem with that is that, A, reducts you ad absurdum. If you're going to go with that, then you're really going to exclude a lot of people that you would otherwise accept as human beings. So what about the severely mentally disabled? They lack reason. They arguably, to a certain extent, lack consciousness. Um, they certainly lack free will in its full form. What about the, the people, those who are asleep? <laughs> what about people who are unconscious, <laughs> people who are in persistent vegetative states, people who are in comas? Yeah, there are all sorts of people who, in other words, lack all these different properties that they say are, that make you a human person. If they are, well, well, it's not, uh, it's not the, if you like, the actualizing of these inherent potentialities within our human nature. It's just, it's just having the, those potentialities there. Well, I'm saying, well, that's exactly true then of an unborn child. An unborn child has all those capacities there. They simply haven't been actualized yet because of their juvenility. In other words, just as a, a newborn baby, who again, doesn't really have free will, doesn't have reason, um, has consciousness, but only in a, a sort of a very low form or a very, uh, to use the term, embryonic form. Um, those kind of things come about because we as human beings grow into them. But there are inherent potentialities all throughout the, our existence, from our, the point of, of being a zygote to the point of being a, an elderly person. We always have those inherent potentialities. Why? Because we have a human nature, and human nature universally has those potentialities, regardless of whether or not those potentialities are actualized uh, or even can't be actualized due to some natural accident. You know, someone might be, again, disabled, or they might have had a horrible car accident or whatever, which prevents them from ever being able to really exercise reason ever again or their free will due to the disability it engenders. But regardless, they're still human beings, and human beings, again, have a human nature, which has purposes, which has a duty to flourish, which therefore has natural rights, and therefore has the right to life. And that is the only consistent way in which you can ass assert the idea or maintain the idea of human rights. If you like the idea of human rights, if you agree with that concept, well, then it behoves you to accept the fundamental undergirding presuppositions and arguments that led to that development of that concept, which is really a classical and Christian concept. Um, the, one of my favorite Dominicans, we were talking about Dominicans earlier on, uh, was a woman, uh, a, a man called Bartolome de las Casas. And he was one of the uh, fra, mm -hmm. Bartolome. Ptolemy de las Casas, and he was one of the early developers of this idea of there being human rights. And he did it precisely to defend the Amerindians who were being effectively, you know, not, not formally, but effectively enslaved by the Spanish um, within the third world, particularly because people were saying, well, they're not really full human beings. You know, we can, we can use them animalistically. Uh, and he said, no, 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 they're human beings. They have natural rights. Uh, they have souls. It's our duty to evangelize them. And therefore, this whole framework and this whole idea, this whole concept of natural rights, human rights uh, came about due to those kind of debates. So this is very much a Christian concept. Uh, and if people want like the idea of human rights, then really they need to uh, accept those, those presuppositions. But again, they're not uniquely Christian. They are effectively the baptized um, the, the baptized form of Greek philosophy, which was then taken by the Christian tradition. And I would say, of course, that that happened within uh, divine providence.
So I, I like I like that you mentioned Bartolome de las Casas. He's one of my heroes. Mm. Um, so um, yeah, I'm a big 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 fan of him. I mean, I would I would say as I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, I would add that that ultimately I think uh, a lot of the claims, you know, a lot of secular claims about um, like I said personhood mm. um, are ultimately rooted in in Christian theological. Uh, or Christian ontological claims, mm. um, you know. So when we talk about, you know, a lot of people throw around terms like human equality, but actually we're not equal. If you, if you, if we, if you just had the three of us in the room, you know, we are not equal in size, in strength, uh, yeah. in 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 all, all sorts of things, and, and our uh, our abilities. You know, we differ quite significantly, and yet, uh, so where where does this human human equality arise from? You know, I can't, I can't, you can't make an incision and find human equality and human uh you know intrinsic value next to the kidney one of your one of your kidneys <laughs> or your liver you know it's not an it's not something that can be empirically discovered uh it's okay. something rooted in in in, in christian theology and, and that's why i always push people back is like actually well like okay so you said that but provide provide me an ontological explanation that's not actually rooted in the christian tradition that you're borrowing from um yeah so it is yeah. quite interesting watching people try and justify sec Christianized secular claims. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Cool. Go on, Dan. No, off. no, no. Crack on. I, I'm, 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 I'm just enjoying listening to Peter. So uh, you, you, I know you. I know you've got some. I know you're you're, you're a, a, a rabid Protestant. You know who's just. <laughs> He's just, he's up, he's up. You're just you're just ready to 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 aim at Peter. Whereas I'll just say for you know for clarity's sake is I'm very Catholic friendly. Uh, I I think uh, so. I talked to Peter before we started. It's um I, you know I recently read uh, Why We're Catholic by Trent Horn, which is a, a really excellent book that I recommend any non well I think anyone should read whether you're a Catholic or not. It'll inform you if you're a Roman Catholic, exactly. uh, and also if 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 you're not, I think it's a, a great book. And as I said to Peter about the first third, I'm like, yep, I could be a Catholic. The next the next third is uh, not so sure. And in the last, I was like, you've lost me, mate. Uh, uh, yeah, well, um, so it'll be interesting. But I, I, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm what that last third was. Yeah, but, yeah, but I know I know Phil's got tons of stuff to fire. Uh, as a, <laughs> an active I, I, I Protestant. <laughs> I think I need to like defend myself first. I wasn't expecting this from you, Dan. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not anti-Catholic. Uh, I'll just, just put it out there. I. Uh, I, I never I said anti-Catholic. <laughs> or I'm a Protestant, whatever, whatever you want. Um, I obviously think Peter's wrong, but <laughs> what kind of. <laughs> Going to start from start from start from me to go on. Um, well, your, your Protestant is the easiest way of saying. It. I mean, I, I think that when we throw around terms like anti-Catholic, I mean, there are people who are anti-Catholic. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. There are people who are genuinely very prejudiced. I've met them, <laughs> many of them. Uh, um, yeah. But and, and often they're they're Catholics who have effectively apostatized. They're people who are either well, to give it the most charitable interpretation, they are either people who weren't treated very well or were you know. Tosby of views, but certainly who had a bad version of Catholicism presented to them, and that's what they're re reacting against. They're not. I ne I never had that excuse. I never could be an anti-Catholic because I had far too many wonderful people I knew who were Catholic, holy priests. I was very blessed with holy men and women who were Catholic Christians, and I always knew that there was a great amount of intellectual integrity and um, credibility to it. Not everyone has had that. So that I have to realise that is a blessing, and so I'm willing to kind of forgive a lot of the kind of anti-Catholicism you see because of the, frankly, the incredible poverty of catechesis that happened in the wake of uh, the 1960s and even during. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are people who are genuinely prejudiced because they've never really encountered Catholicism properly or thought about it properly. They've only ever thought of or encountered a caricature thereof, which they've read in a book or online or in a video or in a film or something along those lines. And those people are genuinely more lazy. I much mm -hmm. more I much more prefer an honest um, an honest opponent, frankly. I mean, I like engaging with my Protestant friends who disagree with me. They know why they disagree with me, but they don't disagree with me out of antipathy. They disagree mm -hmm. with me because they genuinely think I'm wrong and they think they have a really good case for why I'm wrong. Great, bring it on. You know, let's have mm -hmm. that discussion. Because I feel exactly the same way on the other end. I have no antipathy yeah. towards my Protestant brothers and sisters. You know, I love you guys, but I do think that Protestantism is fundamental heresy, and therefore it needs, <laughs> you need to convert. So that's a quick answer mm -hmm. to the question of the podcast. Um, yep. <laughs> you, become, 
<laughs> Catholic Christianity is the fullness of the truth. It's the fullness of it, that's what Catholic means. It means it means universal, but really it has the, the sense of being all encompassing. In other words, it's all of Christianity, not some part of it. Uh, and that's really why I that's that's kind of the case that I make is that Catholic Christianity is precisely that. So um yeah, I think that okay. there is a difference between anti-Catholicism and honest confessional Protestantism. And it's the confessional Protestantism that actually I really enjoy engaging with and, and talking to because I find it not only edifying to have that intellectual exchange and to understand why people believe what they believe, but also because I, I just like having that interaction uh, and I find it very edifying. And as, as Proverbs say, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So let's make that distinction. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's, let, me, let me just turn the light on my in my room because yeah, no worries. It's, it's, it's a bit dark. It's started, it's started to become like a haunting of <laughs> going for the horror story view. <laughs> so uh, while that's, well, that's happening, uh, I got. Uh, I was I was tongue in cheek, Phil, when I called you a rabid Protestant. Were you? I thought you were deadly serious. I'm no, I took it seriously. I'm you offended, Dan. <laughs> You know me by now. I will say. We can see you well. There we go. We can I just, see I just felt like the viewers don't quite know me <laughs> enough yet. For, they don't know I'm joking. For me to, <laughs> for me to be called a rabid Protestant. <laughs> rabid Calvinist. So, um, yeah, it's true. Oh, well, yeah. You've got to watch so, out for that as well. It, yeah, it's interesting what you're saying, Peter, because I, I remember as I, my sort of introduction into, the, into, into Christianity was via sort of Pentecostalism. And there was this, there was nothing, nothing really ever explicit, explicitly kind of said about the Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm. but it was kind of implicit that we, it, it, I had this feeling that you were kind of, it felt like we viewed you as a cult, you yeah. know, as, 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 um, as, as some, you know, you'd taken the wrong path and, um, and, and, and you were, you were in error, but I never, there was, there was never really much of a reason given other than kind of the fact you didn't, dance around as much and seem as yeah. seem as excited it's very similar in terms of how how I, how I initially viewed like anglican like anyone like any anything sort of high church i just incorporated it was not it was not you know well informed perspectives but i just incorporated them into my kind of assump my my assumptions that mm -hmm. that uh you know sort of dead christianity was you you could kind of tell someone's how 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 they what they believed by how they behaved in church but actually it was quite interesting when i saw roman catholics worshiping in africa and they i can't they just look like the local charismatic church uh, right. you know down the road some you know so uh, so um yeah it's just, just it's interesting how i sort of Im imbibed those sort of beliefs about um they, they seem quite common sometimes amongst certain um non-roman catholic churches well, it's a lesson to all of us not to judge by appearances. Um, and I think it's very easy for, for Catholics to do the same thing to Protestants. I think there are a few Pro Catholics I know who'd be quite dismissive. Not a very many, but, but enough that I can, I can say that they exist. Um, and I would want to say to them, look, you know, I, I enjoy listening to and reading on the conservative Protestant end, you know, uh, people like um, James White, to, to someone I've engaged with a lot. Uh, I like listening to Doug Wilson. And reading Doug Wilson, who's a great uh, wordsmith, I like uh, one of my favourite writers is uh, another Englishman living in America. Carl, um, is it called yeah, Carl Truman. Carl Truman, uh, yeah. There are some brilliant, really, really good, um, and very fair-minded and very interesting Protestant thinkers out there. Now, obviously, I think they're wrong when they engage with Catholicism, uh, but at the very least, they are interesting interlocutors. They are well-read. They are, you know, they thought through their opinions very well. Not not again i would say accurately but nonetheless they thought them through and i cannot knowing that um dismiss my protestant friends because i know far too many really good and very intelligent ones um i just have objections to protestantism that i've never found can be overcome and presumably they would say the same to me um that's why it's important for us to engage in this kind of discussion because the only thing that if you know if you realize how important these discussions are then it behoves you to be open to having them i think a lot of people because they've never been taught a how to think but also b how to argue those are two you know life skills those are two skill sets which most people don't haven't even begun to be trained in properly really that's not i'm not trying to be condescending to say that that's just simple fact um, because they haven't had that, they don't know that you can have very, very worthwhile, interesting, enjoyable discussions um, that don't need to end in antipathy or, or, or hostility at all. 
And because people don't believe that, so they think it must end in hostility or antipathy, they just don't talk about them, which is why we have this stupid cultural um, habit of never discussing religion and politics, despite the fact that they're actually the two most important topics to discuss. That's why people get so het up about them. Um, so I, I always say, you know, look, let's not agree to disagree. Let's disagree in order that we might agree. Hmm. I, I guess a good place to start. I have a, a question. That someone's also raised it in, um, in in the chat as well. But I was already thinking: is you, you said we were, uh, you referred to us as as Protestants, as heretics. Yeah. Could you explain? Um, so what what does that mean? So so heretic to me, it, it seems well. I mean, it's very obviously a negative term. Mm -hmm. uh, but is that is, does that mean that we that we are not we cannot be saved you know unless we're um, we're kind of uh, you know signed up members of the roman catholic church or is there still is there still some space for us right well there that's let's just define what we mean heretic means the one who chooses in its etymology so it comes from hieresis which is choice that's exactly what hieresis is it's choice and a heretic is if they're a formal heretic Someone who has chosen to believe something which is false, despite knowing that the church teaches it, teaches its opposite as the truth. So that's what a heretic is. But you can be one of two things. You can be either a formal heretic, someone who, is, who knows that the truth is there, but rejects it. Or a material heretic, which is simply someone who doesn't know the truth is there and, and believes something which is erroneous, but doesn't realize that it's erroneous. Um, so that is only possible, you can only be a heretic in a Christian sense, as far as Catholicism is concerned, if you are actually a Christian, which is why it always makes me laugh to say, oh, you know, you get some Protestants who say, oh, yeah, you, you used to call us heretics, now you call us brothers and sisters in Christ, ha, huh, you know, oh, you've changed your tune, haven't you? Well, actually, no, we haven't changed our tunes at all. We've always said both those things. You are my brother in Christ. And because you're my brother in Christ, because you hold to heresy, heretical views, you're a heretic. If you were a non-Christian, you wouldn't be a heretic at all. You'd be a, a pagan. So the one relies on the other. And you're right, it's not a very nice term, but it's not being used to be a form of name calling. It's there is a technical theological term to describe someone who holds to views that are formally outside of the bounds of Christian orthodoxy. They're not necessarily the bounds of Christianity itself. You can be a Christian and have bad ideas. You can be a Christian and reject even you know formally defined dogma of Christianity, but it doesn't stop you being a Christian. The only thing that the church teaches, the Catholic Church historically has taught that the only two, the only thing that requ you are, is required for you to be a Christian is that, well, apart from having faith, apart from having saving faith in Christ, is that you are actually baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. If you're, in other words, if you've gone through Trinitarian baptism, you are my brother or sister in Christ. You may have very, very bad ideas but you are my brother or sister in Christ. And mm -hmm. what will flow from that, hopefully, is a saving faith. It may not be. It may be you, you don't have a saving faith. You're one of these people who's got baptized but never was properly evangelized. So you've been sacramentalized but not evangelized. Well, okay, that person is still a Christian on some ontological level, even though they are practically speaking you know, an atheist or an apostate. Um, so basically, the, the, the longer the short of that is, therefore, if you are baptized, you are a Christian. In fact, not only that, if you are baptized, you are a Catholic. So to, to answer the kind of the, the, the question of this whole podcast, should I become a Catholic? Well, in one important sense, you already are a Catholic. Mm. Uh, both of you are Catholics if you are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, because you're Catholics, you have the possibility of salvation. Um, and actually, if you, for example, were a, a Protestant who never encountered Catholicism at all, ever in their life, but you made an act of per perfect contrition, which is a, a, a term that we use in, in Catholic Christianity to describe someone who has realized their sin, realized all of their sin, in other words, kneels down before God and says, Lord, I am so sorry. And trusting in the blood of Christ accepts the salvation, the, the forgiveness that is available therefrom, then that you are, it's possible for you to be saved. That's why if you are a Catholic, for example, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, you can't get to confession because all the churches are shut what did the church say you should do need get up if you've committed a mortal sin that is to say a sin that separates you from god due to its gravity because of your intentional um knowledgeable intentional decision to engage in a grave sin that separates you from god if you've done that what should you do if you can't get to confession well even if, or even if you can get to confession before you get there get on your knees and repent and repent and trust in the blood of christ through that, you can be saved. But here's here's the uh, the sticking point, though. Uh, I'm sorry to say this to you both, but 
I'm actually ruining that for you. In a That's way. what I was just saying, because are you turning <laughs> us from formal to material heretics by having I'm this doing, conversation? Uh, exactly. I'm turning you from a material to a formal heretic. So uh, my job, and this is why this makes sense for me to do that, my job as a Catholic uh, and as, as a Christian, so this would be true of my Muslim friends, my Jewish friends, my atheist friends, etc., is to preach the truth in season and out of season and to remove all of what's known as invincible ignorance. So in other words, invincible ignorance is the ignorance you have about the true faith, but which is not your fault, right? You've never been told it. You've never been preached it. It's never, you know, it's never been presented to you. Once it's been presented to you, your ignorance, insofar as it still exists, because you don't know the fullness of it, is invincible. You know there's something there. You know you should look into it, but it behoves you to do so. And insofar as you haven't done so, that's invincible. That's a choice you've made. And you are culpable for that. But you might say, well, OK, why, why would you do that? Why would you put someone in such a spiritually dangerous position? And the answer to that, you, you might like, Phil, uh, is actually quite um, consistent with what so-called the Reformed would believe or the Calvinists, because they accept the, the uh, or accept in, a, in an extreme way the Catholic def, uh, doctrine of predestination. I believe, as a, as a Catholic, that all those who are elect will come to Christ and they will come to Christ through his church. And that therefore, if I preach the fullness of the truth to my Protestant brothers or sisters, those who are elect, those whom God has elected, will accept that truth or will research it more. You know, don't, I'm not expecting people just to accept the truth like that. Uh, it take, usually takes longer, usually it takes thought and proper consideration. But let's say they do, they, they decide I'm going to relook really into this and really uh, try to uh, evaluate this truth. Well, those who are elect will come to the fullness of that truth. Um, and those who won't, will be reprobate and it will be their fault because even though the, the, because the truth has been presented to them they've made a choice to reject it and that is is why that makes total sense really what my job is not to save people only the holy ghost saves people my job is to be the instrument by which he presents the truth to those people and acts on their heart and their mind and their will to bring them into the fullness of the truth which is in his church and so it's not an act of un uncharity for me to preach the truth to you. It's an act of charity, but it trusts on the idea that Christ will, uh, or the Holy Ghost will use that to bring his elect into his church. So it's a bit more complicated than, well, are we, are we out or are we in? No, you are in. You are Christians. You, therefore, you are Catholics. And you have the, the possibility of salvation through repentance. But the more that I, I present the truth to you, I believe, the more and more you are going to be held accountable for what you do with that truth. And to the degree, to the extent that that truth is presented to you, it becomes, it goes from being invincible, not, in other words, a fault, to being invincible. And therefore you move from being merely a material heretic to being a formal heretic. In other words, someone who simply has bad ideas but doesn't know it, someone who has bad ideas and clings to it. Um, so that's where the the kind of distinctions lie. I hope that's not too, uh, too involved, but that, yeah. That works. That's, that's a good start. So, I mean, the, just a, a phrase that you were using was the possibility of salvation or the possum. Mm. So, uh, so you have the baptism, and from that baptism, it's possible to be saved. Mm. So, just I'd be interested in how do you define, uh, and I know it's a ma main point of difference, but I'd be just for clarity's sake, how do you define salvation? How, how are you how do you know you're saved i guess so what is salvation and and what is your assurance of that well that's a great question because i think it introduces two very important points which is that i think a lot of people think a certain you know people who are protestant who are looking at catholic christianity think of us as only having a a view of salvation which is a process so in other words you're never really saved while you're in this life uh, you're only ever kind of going through this process and you're just trying to get holy enough so that when you get when you die, you'll get to heaven. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, that's never been Catholic Christianity. The, the, the truth is that salvation is two things. It's both a state and it is a process as well. So insofar as it's a state, what is salvation? Salvation is being cleansed by the blood of Christ through the instrumentality of the sacraments of the church. So that's two things. That is baptism first way that you are cleansed of your sin is in baptism both of the effect of, of original sin and also all the personal sins you've committed assuming you have up to that point in your life and then after baptism the way you re-establish that or rather the way that christ re-establishes it in you is through the sacrament of, of confession through penance so the sacrament of penance is simply you going to a priest 
And he has the authority by Christ when he said to the apostles, he breathed on them and said, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. He gave them the authority right there to absolve people of their sins, not in a primary sense. They say this the, the person who the only one who really forgives sins is God. God is the only one who can really forgive any sin at all. But he uses priests as instruments, as ministers of redemption. And so when the priest says ego to absolvo in the Latin or I absolve you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, having heard the genuine confession of all the sins of a genuinely penitent, repentant person who trusts in that going in that they're going to the sacrament of confession in the blood of Christ as mediated through the sacraments, that person is then justified again. So they are made just. They are restored to righteousness. They're cleansed of all the sin that they'd committed up to that point. And so salvation in that sense to that person is a state. You're in what's known as a state of grace. And in a state of grace, you are saved. If someone were to kill you right there and then, if you were to be run over by a bus, you would go to heaven. Now you would go to heaven via, for example, purgatory, which is another thing. That's to do with more to do with sanctification. It's to do with the purging away of the, the temporal punishments you have accrued due to your sins. And we could go into a whole, that's a whole other rabbit hole. Uh, which we could go down, which we may come to. But fundamentally, you are in a state of salvation because you're in a state of friendship with God. You are part of his body, which is the body of Christ, the church. You are in Christ. You are engrafted into Christ himself. And because of that, you will enter into what's called the beatific vision. That is to say, com theosis, communion with God, if you like, or union with God in heaven. But it's also a process as well. Even though you're in a state of grace, you nonetheless will be growing towards that perfection you have in Christ, which you will fund, you will eventually reach when you are in heaven itself in that union. And so consequently, it's true to say that uh, I, I can say I have been saved. I've been saved by my baptism. I've been saved by the confession I most recently went to. I am saved, I can say, insofar as I am morally, and I'm, I will say this about myself right now, I am morally confident that I'm in a state of grace. Uh, that's why I will go to the sacrament of the Eucharist. I will receive the Eucharist because I believe that I would be receiving worthily. Uh, if you believe that you're in a state of mortal sin, you should not receive the Eucharist because you would be eating and drinking judgment upon yourself, um, 1 Corinthians 11. But at the same time, I am being saved insofar as I am a work in progress. God is not finished with me yet. He is sanctifying me. And therefore, what that means is the more that I do, I go through uh, good works, the more God receive, give pours more actual graces within me that allow me to become holier and holier and holier, sanctified and sanctified and sanctified. Not because I'm earning that grace, but rather because God as a father is rewarding the good works that I'm doing with further grace because I'm coming more and more and more into the person he is, who he has for me to be in Christ. So to answer the question through all of that, Salvation is a state, they say it is a state of grace. You are in a state of friendship with God. You are engrafted into Christ and therefore into his body, the church. And it means that therefore, if you die through an accident, you will go to heaven. But it's also a process insofar as it, it, it's a, it is part of a continuum whereby you are becoming the person you will be in heaven in Christ. So sanctification and justification are fundamentally related um, they are fundamentally part of the same continuum, but they are still distinct within Catholic Christianity. It's not just purely a process. You're not just in a state of complete um, doubt about whether you will, you're will. you actually in God's grace. You can know that you're in God's grace, uh, or rather you can have moral confidence that you're in God's grace due to your knowledge of the actions you've committed during the week and the sacraments of, of confession which you have, by God's grace, received. But fundamentally, yeah, like I say, it's, that, it's important to realise that it is a state and a process. Both those truths have to be maintained uh, in orthodox soteriology. So I hope that answers that question that wasn't too involved. Again, stop me if I'm going <coughs> too much. No, it's, it's good because uh, there's there's a few sort of follow-up questions. I mean, I, I'm happy with sanctification, but um, and s salvation would be too... Yeah, the, the way that I read, so you've got things like Romans uh, 11... Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, verse six, but if it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So that's mm -hmm. talking about um, that, that's how salvation comes by grace. Linking that with Ephesians 2, I'll read it a little bit more. Verse eight, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. Mm -hmm. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So that's salvation. 
yeah. and not a result of work so that no one may boast. And then sanctification, sanctification comes in verse 10, for it is his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it's it's not the, I, I would say that it's not the works that brings grace. Grace abounds through Christ and we find our salvation in him by faith in him mm. to the extent that it's not uh, I mean, maybe a follow-up question in a moment so and that's that's kind of how i see it so salvation comes first through grace by mm. faith in christ then it comes to sanctification is an outworking of our salvation sure uh yeah that's the standard that's the standard protestant belief that i'm aware of um i think that what you have to that it's important to distinguish here is the way that we talk about works with regards to grace because i think this is very often uh, something which is simply not really well understood firstly we don't uh, let's just let's just get out of the way what we don't believe that we would all commonly reject um, the first three canons of the council of trent on justification reject two heresies in christian history one is called pelagianism the other is called left us hanging is it just me that's frozen Semi, semi Pelagian is. Is it just me that's frozen, or is everyone else frozen? <laughs> no, I think it's. I think it's uh, Peter. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, all right. Oh. So we've got a technical glitch here, Peter. You left us hanging with a um, Pelagianism oh. and something, something else. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, can hear, hear you. you your, but, your picture's but, frozen. Oh, my picture's frozen. Okay um don't know what to do about it oh, oh you're coming back now you're back it's coming back just had a temporary glitch so we, we heard plagianism and then it froze with the second <laughs> we're all like oh ah. what's the second <laughs> what's the next one um well the next one's semi-pelagian did you hear semi-pelagianism so semi-pelagianism oh, was yeah, yeah. that was that was created effectively as a compromise to try to uh find a middle ground between pelagius the, the person who created the guy who created pelagianism hence the heresy um and the theology of saint augustine uh who, who was very much the opponent of uh pelagianism and i'm very much an augustinian because i'm, I'm a thomist uh, i'm a follower of saint thomas aquinas that gives you my sort of theological background um and pelagian semi-pelagianism is effectively said so I, I don't know if you heard the definition pelagianism says you earn your salvation semi-pelagianism says okay look no no, no we, it, it's a bit more complicated than that we um we basically start up the car but then God feeds in the fuel, if you like. That's that's the kind of analogy I would use. So semi-Pelagianism wants to carve out one area where man alone is gaining a, a foothold in God's grace, and then God God just sort of feeds the rest. Well, both of those are rejected by the church's magisterium. We would say that there is literally no area where man can carve out for himself a claim on salvation. Every single part of the process of salvation is by God's grace. Now, here we have to distinguish what we mean by God's grace. Um, I mean, I'd ask what individual Protestant friends of mine think they mean by, by grace, because it, not everyone gives the same answer. But my understanding for a lot of Protestants is that grace is literally just the favour of God, if you like. So in other words... Un uh, unmerited. Yeah, the unmerited yeah. favour of God, uh, which is imputed, in, it, and we can go into what Im imputation means. Um, whereas for us, for, for Catholics, actually we see grace as something which is, or we, we define grace as what's called ontic grace. So grace, in other words, is, um, how can it be described? It's the shared divine life of God. It's a, it is, to more, use more technical language, um, it is an accident which inheres within the soul. That is to say, it's something outside the soul which inheres within the soul and has an effect. So sanctifying grace is that grace which washes us clean of our sin, and restores us to original righteousness, Actual grace is that shared divine life of God, which he communicates to enable us to do good acts. Um, so there are different ways we can talk about grace, but effectively it is God's shared divine life or, or an accident, something outside us, which is put into us that accomplishes an outcome within us. Where, where do we find God's... that distinction? So, sorry, Peter, I'm going to have to keep... You know, my... sure. where, where do we find that distinction in scripture between the different kinds of grace you just outlined? Well, I think that we what we find it is the way that grace is described. So in other words, when we talk about God's grace acting in a particular way, and also then we combine that with the fact that the tradition understands grace to be something which is communicated by God, not merely in terms of his favour towards us, 
but rather to be uh, like a thing, if you like. Um, that's the, the deepening of the understanding of grace that we find within the tradition. So when we talk about grace, we just have to realize that you and I might be using the term, but we might be using it with different things in mind. So this is to define what I mean or what, what Catholic Christianity rather, because what I think doesn't really matter at all. What Catholic Christianity means when it talks about God's grace with regards to works. Um, and so when we talk about salvation and how grace works and how works in some way involve themselves within it, the most helpful thing is to talk about how we understand salvation being caused. And this is something which the Council of Trent, again, to, to, just to explain to your viewers, the Council of Trent was the uh, Catholic Reformation Council. It was the council which was held in sort of the 1540s to the 1560s. And it defined the church's position against Protestantism to a very great extent. There are lots and lots and lots of uh, definitions that come out of that against what the Protestants are saying to re-establish Christian orthodoxy in the way that Catholic Christianity understands it, but at the same time reforming the church away from some of the abuses that had crept in, establishing seminaries, that kind of thing. So it's the, it's the great Catholic council of the 16th century. And again, it's defining what the truth of justification is in a way that is much more systematic than came before, as far as the, the, the magisterium of the church had defined it. And what it does in the sixth session, which is the session that deals with justification, is it says, OK, look, it's like this. Let's think about the way that something is caused. So uh, and I, I, John, uh, I had uh, a discussion with Jonathan McClatchy, uh, another web discussion with Jonathan McClatchy, in which I presented this. So if someone wants to go and have a look at that discussion, uh, they can see that on his uh, discussion as well. But when we talk about a thing, let's say we talk about a statue. We can talk about the way that the statue is caused by with, with regards to different elements. So the material cause of a statue means what it's made out of. So we're talking about a, a, a statue which has been carved by a, a sculptor. If you talk about its material cause, you're talking about the marble. It's made up of marble. That is the material out of which it is made. But then we can talk about what's called the efficient cause. So in other words, but yeah, but okay, what affects the statue? It's just a block of marble. What makes it into a statue? Well, it's the actual sculptor himself. The sculptor is the efficient cause, that the person who affects the statue. You could talk about the, the meritorious cause. So in other words, who actually bought uh, the, the labor of the sculptor to actually make the statue. So that's another kind of cause. You can talk about the formal cause which is slightly more complicated. It really means rather more what makes the statue what it is, what, what causes it to be formed in the way that it does. And really it's the idea in the case of the statue, it's the idea within the mind of the sculptor to actually make it like this. It's, it's a bit, bit more complicated than that in other ways, but these are all useful for saying, to making distinctions about what we mean when we say how, how something is brought about. So if we apply that to salvation, what, what would we say? And the, the Council of Trent says, okay, this is, this is the way that it works. We have the uh, material. The, we have the meritorious cause of our salvation, which is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Only what Christ did on the cross, in other words, earning the grace of God by His perfect sacrifice on the cross, the, the offering of His precious blood. Only that is the sole meritorious cause of our salvation. But then we can also talk about the efficient cause. Well, okay, but who affects salvation? Well, again, there's only one, and that's the loving God Himself, the Holy Trinity, who affects that salvation in the life of each individual. But we can also talk about a secondary efficient cause. What brings that about? Well, it's God's grace, and it's God's grace alone that does that. It doesn't you know, mention anything else. There's nothing else that affects God's salvation within us. It is his grace alone. That is to say the shared divine life he pours into us. And then we can talk about, okay, what is what is salvation? In other words, what is its formal cause? What What is the form that salvation takes in our life? Well, in that sense, it is the infusion of righteousness. It is making us just. Justification is literally making you just. So the way it works is Christ, by his righteousness, has earned us the grace of God, has merited for us, in other words, that grace by the offering of his precious blood. So what God the Father does to all those who come to him through his church is that he pours that grace into them through the instrumentality of the sacraments. That's another form of cause. The instrumental cause of salvation is baptism and confession, um, and in other ways like that as well. You can also talk about you know, us getting God's grace through prayer and 
things this like is, that. This is where you lose me, Peter, because okay. this is this is because I think I'm with Luther on this, where his sort of disdain for the marriage between Aristotle and and, and theology, okay. and uh, I, I think this is where you lose a lot. Where Roman Catholics lose a lot of Protestants when they start getting into you know Aristotelian metaphysics and talking about formal efficient and and then court formal causes and things like that. Because I, I, I think why would it, that be? Because as far as I'm concerned, it's not so much Aristotle; it's just common sense. I mean, no, we're, we're, I mean that, that, that's, 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 that's the nature. I didn't of find that common. No, I, there's, no, there's nothing. <laughs> I think I think this is this this is when you lose it again. This is look, if you speak to a, a normal person, like you know, I have, I have I have I have I have like some sort of philosophical background. You know, I've got postgraduate training in ethics. Like I, I've tried, like I. I've tried, like I have an interest in Aristotle, especially when it, uh, you know, especially when it comes to you know substance view of persons and and tomies and things like that. But it it it's not it's not there's nothing common sense about understanding um, what what you just said. Like unless like, I'm a dummy, and I think a lot, and I don't think that Protestants are stupid. I think that a lot of Protestants just get lost when we start talking about. Um, we start getting to, as I said, Aristotelian metaphysics to make to justify theological claims about grace. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying that, like, and it was very eloquent, you know, what you said. Uh, but um, it, there's, the nothing, is, there's, there's what, nothing what as common to, about what, what you have to understand is that this isn't a matter of justifying anything. What it is is, is it's an explanatory way of trying to say where do we truly disagree. Right. I'm not trying to defend what I believe by saying these things. What I'm trying to do is say, right, this is this is common sense, right? Because what I'm saying is these are ways in which you can talk about the various ways in which things are caused. It is common sense to say that this book is made up of stuff, right? And the stuff it's made out of is its material cause. That's not a controversial statement. That's just a fact. That is what we talk about when we talk about the thing out, the stuff out of which a book is made, or a marble statue, or the flesh of a human being, or whatever else. So, a material cause, or a formal cause, or an instrumental cause, or or any of these things, they, it might sound complicated. And I realise that it can sound rather too arcane, or too terminological, or too philosophical. But all of the things that I've just said are, are simply commonsensical. If you if you looked at a statue, you would say, "Oh, yeah, I can see." okay that it's made up of stuff that it was formed in the mind of the sculptor that the sculptor affected it so as the efficient cause that it was bought by a particular or that the labor was purchased by a particular person so they merited it in that way that the instrument by which the sculptor actually chiseled away the marble the stuff of the statue to make it into the form of the statue itself in other words the chisel and the other tools he used well those are the instrumental causes those aren't justifications for talking about statuary they're simply a description of what statuary is and the same thing's true of salvation salvation is something which occurs within human reality and as such it can be described in terms of what god is doing in human reality in terms of these different causes so we talk about his instruments the, the sacraments we talk about him being the effector of it the efficient cause we talk about how it was earned for us which is what christ did on the cross we talk about the form it takes in other words what is justification in other words is it infused or imputed? And all of those could be just as much said about a Protestant schema of how we understand salvation as it would be a Catholic. So it's not a Catholic attempt to employ Aristotelian controversial metaphysics to somehow justify our own beliefs. Rather, it's a use of what are commonsensical concepts that just happened to be, I think providentially, developed within Greek philosophy and then were appropriated and baptized by Christians because they're just simply um, intellectual tools with which to look at reality. And then say, okay, using those tools, how can we define what the differences are between us? So that's what I want to do. I want to say, where do we really disagree here? And yeah, and I'm presumably yeah. say is, okay, the formal cause is not infused the infused righteousness, it's imputing the righteousness of Christ by what his life and death and resurrection to the believer. And the instrumental cause is not going to be sacraments, it's going to be faith alone. And I would want to then ask you what you mean by faith, but we can go on to that. Um, or the meritorious cause. The reason why I brought that up is because I think a lot of uh, Protestants have the idea that Catholics believe that we earn our salvation by our works. And as I say, no, Catholics explicitly deny you can earn your salvation by works. Works only uh, work as it were in this whole process because God is rewarding like a loving father would reward to his child who has done his chores he doesn't have to reward him at all you do your chores if you're a child you don't you don't earn anything by doing that but a good a loving father might say oh well you did your chores well done I'll buy you an ice cream right that's effectively it is a divine form of condescension that God rewards our works 
at all. It's certainly not a form of, of earning that what Paul would rightly critique in Romans uh, when it says that you know a worker um, doesn't doesn't receive by grace; he receives by just wages. Um, all of these things matter. These, these these little understandings of causes because they clarify what you and I differently mean, and then we can have a discussion as to therefore where do we really disagree. Rather than having a kind of a, a sort of shadow boxing discussion as to, well, mm. I think this and, and you think that, and actually we're not clear clear about where the disagreement really lies. Um, so that's why. Can I, can, I, can I come on on that? So I think my, my, my main example that I struggle with when it comes down to that you're saved and then through the sacraments, mm. I, I struggle that with passages like Acts 10, for example, with Cornelius clearly wasn't baptized first before the Holy Spirit worked with him. Uh, they baptize him be because he clearly was Christian and the Holy Spirit was upon him. I, I would say it was that point that he was clearly saved. Uh, the, the thief on the cross couldn't be baptized off the cross <laughs> to, to be saved and he's turned up in, in paradise. So I, I think there's, there's my struggle when we, we try and have like I, I kind of agree with Dan. Like I can't I understand what you're saying with all these mm. different causes, but I, I just don't find it necessary. <laughs> find, like it's I, like believe it. Like faith alone, it, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And the outworking of that is your sanctification. Well, the salvation aspect is actually fairly straightforward. Um, and I think maybe this is where. I would disagree with the sort of reformed aspects because I, I don't see a tension between God's sovereignty and man's will. There's there's these, in one sense, if you read Romans on its own, maybe you'll get predestination. If you read Hebrews on its own, you'll get free will. You continue to deliberately sin, then you'll be taking away salvation. You read Hebrews on its own, that's what, what you kind of come away with. Hmm. Romans, it's it's all it's all grace. Well, put the two together. You, you, they, they are held in tension, scripturally speaking, and you'll find the tension within Romans itself. If you look hard enough, you'll find the tension with Hebrews if you look hard enough. So I, th I think these is it's within these, this, this idea that what I'm hearing is, yes, God God pours out his grace on us, but there's, there's the response of us. There's still the cause in our wills to respond. And I think... At the moment, I'm I'm like this is a really complex evangelism. Yeah, since this isn't evangelism at all, I, I take it for granted that you have the evangel, that you have the gospel. Um, this is where I think where people get a bit unstuck when we talk about do do Catholics and Protestants uh, agree on the gospel? Well, I, I'd like to think we do. Uh, the reason I say that is because what the gospel means is the core message of Christ, which is, and, and I think this is scriptural. Well, if you understand, if you understand what yeah. the, the scriptural writers say, what, what, what when they describe the gospel, what do they describe? They describe the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And in the first century context, and I described this in my debate with James R. White on on purgatory, is purg uh, um, sorry on um, indulgences are indulgences in keeping with the gospel. I define what we mean by the gospel scripturally, which is that it is. Um, within this first century context, a euangelion was the declaration of a victory after a military battle. So in other words, if you were a kerux, and this is where we get the term kerygma from, a kerux was a herald. So a kerygma or kerygma is a herald, you know, someone pronouncing something. So we talk about the basic kerygma of the gospel. What we actually really mean is it's like this. Uh, a big battle has come out, had out, been had outside your city. And if the invading army win, You'd all be slaughtered or enslaved, uh, or, or it'll be existential disaster for your whole way of life. But let's say that you, your army wins the battle. Well, then the Kerux from your army goes back to the city and declares the battle's won. We, we're safe. That is a Evangelion in a first century context. Mm. So when we talk about the Evangelion, we talk about the gospel, what are we talking about? It's the declaration of the victory of Christ and the establishment of his messianic kingdom. So insofar as you and I agree, Christ has won the battle and he's established his kingdom, even if we disagree on how that's then played out, we nonetheless share the same gospel. We're, we're declaring the same thing. So I would say that Catholics and Protestants agree on the gospel. What we disagree on is the Didache, that is to say the secondary teaching that comes out of that. That's what Didache means. It comes from, uh, it basically means teaching. And so when we're talking about these things, I, I realize that going through causes might sound sort of like, um, it's complicated, but it's certainly not evangelization because I take for granted that you are already evangelized. This is more catechesis. This is about saying what is true teaching that flows from 
the gospel. And I, I get why you say um, that, well, you know, you've got things like the thief, the thief on the cross. Uh, he was saved by faith. But what I would say in response to that, and, and Acts 10, other people that seem to be saved um, based on their faith. Well, there are, there are several things I'd want to say to that. It's, it's actually quite a wide ranging discussion. But firstly, I'd make a distinction. I'm going to afraid I'm going to be continuing to make distinctions throughout this, this whole discussion, which is between a normative means of salvation and an exclusive means of salvation. So do I believe that you must be water baptized to be saved? No, I don't. I do think it's the normative means of salvation. So in other words, it's clearly taught within Holy Scripture that baptism now saves you, not as a washing of filth from the flesh, but as an appeal for a clear conscience to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 1 Peter 18 uh, to 21. Now, if you're getting baptized, you presumably already have faith. So why does baptism involve an appeal for a clear conscience? Surely your conscience should already be clear by virtue of your faith. Well, clearly it isn't. That's why you're getting baptized. Bapti ba baptism, in other words, as you know, Christians believed from the very get-go, baptism regeneration is a universal belief of early Christianity right to now. They believe that it's baptism that affects your justification, not faith alone, not simply believing. And actually, I'd wanted to ask you what you mean by faith, because I mean, I think different people have under different understandings of what they think faith actually means. Um, so I, I'll, I'll go into, uh, I would ask you that. Um, so trust, <laughs> yeah. trust, trust that Christ is so my, my assurance is in the fact that I'm trusting Jesus' name is good enough for me. Right. Is so that, it's trust. that's how you would define yeah. uh, faith. Well, that, the that's my understanding of the background of the, the word trust or faith pistis in in new testament pistios yeah pistis uh yeah no pistis actually means belief uh so if we were being very very strict about it uh what we would say is that actually it's believing in christ that saves without necessarily trust or repentance but when we ask when someone asks uh peter saint peter you know okay what must we do to be saved he says repent and be baptized he doesn't say faith he doesn't say believe he says, repent and be baptized for the salvation, for the sorry, for the remission of your sins. So I would say that it's not merely if, if what if what we if we're going by what Paul says, if we're trying to go by. Uh, Paul keeps on mentioning that we're saved by faith. I, I would point out in Romans, the great uh, source for a lot of Protestant theologians for this idea of, of faith alone. I would point out the first and last time we find the word faith in the book of Romans is the phrase the i think it's the parakion to pistio that is to say the obedience of faith what paul seems yeah, to mean happy with that with repentance um, as part of that <laughs> right. so i, I just just want to put it put in i don't i don't disagree i think trust by trusting you 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 will obey that is the outworking of your trust in in christ ah uh, but it doesn't say that it doesn't say an outworking it says Repent and be baptized for the remission. Sorry, back, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and then it talks about the obedience of faith as what Paul wants to bring about. And I would suggest that when we compare that with what he says in Galatians five, so Galatians being the, if you like, a shorter version of the argument he's making in Romans against the Judaizers, he says it is not circumcision which does anything, but a faith that works by agape. That is to say, it's usually translated in older translations as charity. It means self-giving love it, faith that works by love but particularly self-giving love and i would argue that what paul clearly is doing here is he's using faith as what's known as a synecdoche a synecdoche for those who, who don't know that from the audience a synecdoche is effectively a word that encapsulates that's part of a thing but encapsulates the whole of a thing so if i let's say i talk about number 10 downing street if i talk about number 10 downing street so number 10 downing street did this we all understand that what i really mean is not the building what I, we understand I mean is the prime minister's office, right? Well, we might say the, the palace said this or Buckingham Palace said that. Well, we don't mean the palace, the building. We mean the monarchy. We mean Her Majesty the Queen. And so what that's an example of synecdoche where a building in which someone resides, which is part of the whole institution, is being taken to represent the whole of the thing. Well, that's exactly what I think is happening in Romans and Galatians and elsewhere when Paul's making his argument. Faith is being used as synecdoche to, re to refer to all the things that save, which includes repentance, baptism, works of charity, and all the things, in other words, that form that faith through love. Because it's love, the ultimate charity, agape, that really forms us into salvation. So I would say that there's the, there's the dividing line between us. 
Um, you are interpreting faith to mean trust alone. I'm saying that if you look at the way that Paul is using the word, it rather suggests that actually he uses it as a synecdoche to include all these other things. And that's made very clear by this clear teaching of scripture that baptism actually does save us. It doesn't merely signify a salvation that's already happened through faith alone. How do you show that you trust someone? How do you, what, sorry? How do you know? How do you show how that show? you trust someone? That, how do you sh if I was to say I trust you that might mean nothing until I show you it so how, how would I show you that I trust you by giving me stuff I suppose <laughs> that you would trust yeah, me. but um, by my actions by the outworkings yeah. of my trust so I trust in Jesus that he saves me and by my trust I then will repent baptized mm -hmm. and, and so it's the outworking of my faith and my trust that then shows <laughs> it, it, I I know yeah. I'm saved, and therefore I will do these things. It's, there's no point in repenting if I don't trust. Oh, I agree. Look, don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not saying that trust is irrelevant here. I I, I absolutely believe that a saving faith is trusting in Christ. Uh, there's absolutely no question about that. Uh, but what I'm saying is that trust alone is not the sole instrumental cause of our salvation. And that's the disagreement between us. What is the instrument by which we attain the salvation which Christ has given us? How, in other words, so, another way of saying this, how is, what is the instrumental means by which Christ gives us his salvation? And you're saying that it's faith, and by faith you mean trust. And I'm saying, well, if we look at the whole of what Holy Scripture says, it's clearly not just trust alone. A, faith doesn't mean trust, it means belief. But I'll agree with you that faith involves trust. It also involves repentance, and it also involves baptism, and it also involves working through love. So all of that together is what Paul, it seems to me, means by, sal by, by faith. In other words, the faith that saves. And it's not a matter of, well, these things come about necessarily after you've been saved. No, no, these are the instrumental means by which we are saved. And that's why it says baptism now saves you, rather than baptism signifies the salvation which has already been accomplished by trust that you have in what Christ has done. That It doesn't say that. It says baptism saves you. And it says repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's why it says in Romans 6, you know, be, with baptism, we are buried into Christ and rise up with him. That's not a symbolic thing. That's a spiritual reality. So mm -hmm. I think it's very, very clear within Holy Scripture that it's more than just trust alone that saves. It's all these other things that form part of genuine Christian faith. And that is a wider concept than simply trust on its own. Dan. Yeah, no, I mean, there's there's nothing for me. It doesn't seem as, as as simple as 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 Paul meaning by faith that he's actually wrapped these other things in that you that you presume he, you know is entailed within that. Uh, it doesn't seem as I know it's not an obvious reading to me that that's that's what he means. Like uh, like it, it's not it's not clear. Like you know it it, it wouldn't have been a um, I don't know. It just it doesn't seem as obvious to me that that's that's the case. Like you you've you've asserted that's the case based on what Peter says. But it just doesn't seem clear um, from me that that when when Paul says faith, he also means these other things that you've. Uh, he also means baptism as well within constituted within that um, his his use of faith. Uh, yeah, I'm not really out. I mean, could he could do? I'll, you know, I'll look into it. Uh, it's it's um, but. I've I've never I've never read it that way. It's never seemed an obvious reading to me. Um, well, to again, fair, you know, I, have, I have talked to, I have talked about what Paul said. I talked about Romans six, where he does say that you are, we are with baptism, we are buried into Christ and rise up with Him, which would involve salvation, and therefore that has a direct relevance to his whole argument in Romans. I've mentioned that he said talks about the obedience of faith based in Romans 1, 6 and Romans 16, 26, the first and last time he even uses the word faith in his entire argument. I've also mentioned that he talks about in Galatians 5, 6, that it is not circum... In encapsulating his whole argument, which is the argument he uses in Romans, he doesn't just say, you're saved by faith alone. What he says is, it is not circumcision that accomplishes anything, but a faith that works in charity. So when we look at everything that Paul says, in other words, if we look intertextually and contextually, as well as intertextually within the things that St. Peter actually teaches, not only in 1 Peter 3, 18 to 21, but also what he teaches in the book of Acts, it's very clear to me uh, that the most obvious reading is that what Paul means by faith is not trust alone, or even belief and trust alone, or belief alone. It is, in fact, all the things that I mentioned within the Holy Scripture is actually having salvific effect, and that those, therefore, are the instrumental means of salvation, not faith alone. 
Yeah, I mean, um, when he talks about, um, in Galatians 5, he talks about faith working through love. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I've always understood that as, as, a, as a faith, a belief that results in works of love. Um, sure, I've, but I'd say that's a Protestant gloss rather than sort of a, a, an exegesis of what is actually being said there. Um, because again, remember what he's doing. He's encapsulating his whole argument. He's saying what does actually save as opposed to what doesn't. He's saying circumcision doesn't. Now, we can argue about what he means by that. I mean, I, I do think that it probably does mean you're not saved by being Jewish, but you're also not saved by effectively doing these things within Judaism that you think will actually earn you kind of credit before God, which would include the works of the law like circumcision. But regardless, he's saying that doesn't save, right? That's wrong. You Judaizers, you're trying to make people go back to the old law when the old law is fulfilled in Christ. That's not what saves. What does save? And then he says it's a faith that works by charity. So he includes it. No, it's faith working it's by charity. Expressing it's expressing itself. Alone. It's not faith that will therefore necessarily later do works of charity because as a natural outcome. No, no, no. It's faith. It doesn't works say that it works itself. through charity. Yeah, it doesn't say by charity. The faith that works by charity is, is the translation I have. Yeah, uh, that's not. not the, the, one. I'm, I'm happy to, to have yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I've never read it that way. So that's what I mean. That, I think that's why I'm a bit un- not uncomfortable, but I, the way you're reading it, is not how I've ever read it. Uh, again, I don't. I don't read, you know, Chronic Greek. Uh, but uh, I think if I read something like the ESV, or uh, uh, I've never, I've never read it that way. I think if I did, then maybe that I could. I, I probably would lend a bit more support to what you're saying. But I've never, I've never read it that way. Not by oh, charity, but working through through uh, through yeah. charity through yeah. love. And that's actually very different. Um, I think that's. But again, what do you, I, I, I look what do you see it, the difference? I, what do you see the difference to be? I'm not quite. I'm just looking up the Greek myself. What, uh, so uh, I, what do you find the difference to be? Um, because it's uh, deep. Uh, yeah. It is literally through. Because yeah. it's it's short of dear. So it's dear, faith dear working agape. through love. Yes. Because it's, you're you're this the agape. So man. what that's that's kind of the point I was trying to make is that our faith. It's the saving faith in Jesus that then leads to or is outworked through baptism, self, like working out our salvation. So, so the sanctification process is at least the justification. For the the salvation is sorry. Salvation is what saves us, makes us justified before God. And how we know that and are assured by that is then working the works through love, rather than salvation is this state and process thing that that, so saving faith (laughs) comes first we then know in our assurance we're saved through repentance through baptism through and and i would say that initial faith is shown by calling on the name of the lord and you'll be saved Uh, so you call on the name that generally implies you're also repenting that's generally comes hand in hand and the outworking of that salvation is then the discipleship and, and sanctification. But again, though, I, I would say that's a gloss rather than an exegesis. Um, that's not what's said in Acts 22. Um, it does say, you know, what do I need to be saved? Repent and be baptized. It doesn't say believe, and then as a natural consequence of this, you'll repent and be baptized. No, no, no. Repent yeah, and but be that, baptized. That, that's a bit uncharitable in the sense that there's there's all sorts of Roman Catholic doctrines we have that are not explicitly detailed in in that way. Um, so it, it, I mean, there's. It, Why do you think it, that uh, well, that would be relevant in this case? Because what I'm trying well, to do is build from yeah. what scriptures actually do say, rather than you know. Yeah, I don't it know. Is, uh, no, it's, so, it's, no, well, you're saying it's a gloss, and I'm saying it's. I'm I'm saying it's. To me, it doesn't. Uh, it, it doesn't feel like a gloss. It feels like taking scripture as a whole and looking at. I guess that's what you're you're trying to do as well. I've just never like. It, it doesn't feel like a gloss. It feels like we're trying to read what Paul means by grace, and it's not obvious that he meant baptism. Uh, well, no, and, I think what you're doing uh, is you're trying to read what he means by faith rather than by grace. Well, um, because yeah, what you're I trying think... to do is say faith means trust. And it's only that which saves. And I'm saying there are so many scriptural uh, scriptural passages which make it very clear that salvation is affected instrumentally by other things other than trust. So not just baptism, but also repentance and also works of charity. And also, yeah, it's a, in other words, it's not just trust alone which really saves us here. 
it's also all these other things. And so if Paul is talking about faith and using that as a term, when he's also saying that baptism saves and he's also saying that repentance saves and he's also saying the works of charity saves, then it makes more sense to say actually what he means by faith, what he's doing is using faith, which is actually just belief, not trust, but, faith, but belief, pistis, as a synecdoche of all the things which he commonly teaches, and so does St. Peter, as actually affecting our salvation. To me, that makes more sense of all of scripture taken together rather than taking um, a particular idea of, well, trust is what really saves you, and then these things come about. Well, it doesn't say any of that. Um, I don't find a passage in the Holy Scripture that teaches that schema. But it, but it does, though. You've just made them exclusive. You, you've excluded them. <laughs> so they are there. We, we've built this so, so that you, you just made two distinctions. So I, I point to the thief on the cross and I point to Cornelius and I can point to the jailer in Acts 16. And it yes. says, what, what's the response there? Believe in the Lord and you and you will be saved. It's belief, it's, it's trust. The outworking of that trust through love is to then be baptized. But it's the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ that has saved you. Mm. So uh, this this schema that's is not, there. Again, that's not what, the, what it says. You, what you're saying is it has these uh, verses which talk about belief saving. But when I yeah. then compare them to these other verses, which say that it's other things that save, then I can harmonize them together and say, okay, yeah, belief saves, but so do these other things. So these, there are these other instrumental causes of salvation. And the thief on the cross is easily understood. And in fact, Lutherans understand it this way. It's not just a, a Catholic thing. Yeah. Also, there are also Protestants who understand this, that yes, you can be saved by, by faith alone in certain circumstances. Actually, as a Catholic, I believe you can be saved by faith alone in certain circumstances. I made that mm. clear at the very beginning of the program where I said, yeah, okay, yeah, if, yeah. You, if you kneel down and you repent of your sins, even if you don't get to the confessional, you will be saved, right? So there yeah. are clearly exceptional circumstances in which someone's repentance of their sin and belief in trust in Christ alone will save them. I don't disagree with that for one second. Yeah. But what I'm, we're talking about here is not what is the exceptional means of salvation. We're You're talking about, about what's normative. normative. Exactly. Okay. And so right. I'm saying that the normative means of salvation, whilst I totally accept that those are there, I'd say the normative means is faith and trust and repentance and baptism and confession and indeed all the things the Holy Scripture and sacred tradition all together teach are the instrumental means by which God pours his grace into us and makes us righteous, thereby saving and justifying us through his gracious mercy and by only what the sacri by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the presentation of and the sacrament of his precious blood. So that, I think, is a more parsimonious encapsulation of all the data of Revelation rather than trying to say, OK, I'm going to insist that it's trust and, or belief or whatever it is that faith means in, in individual Protestant circumstances. And I'm going to try to use that as the prism through which I look at all these other verses, even if, and I would say this is clearly the case, those verses themselves don't seem to marry at all with the idea that it's trust alone that saves. Right. Got you. OK. Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 I think I'm there. Gone. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, no, you I, get I, I like I like what you said. This in um, yeah, I've never I've never thought of it like that. So it's an interesting alternate kind of way to to kind of look at those verses. So I'll definitely uh, I'll do a bit of reading around that. I'm very aware uh, that as as normal in Protestant and Roman Catholic discussions that we get kind of got stuck on uh, one topic. We get we get, we get around <laughs> faith, justification, and, and yeah. grace. So I would be. I know a lot of people. Um, you know, when we, when we mentioned we have new on, had lots of other issues that they wanted to, to, to chat about as well. And I'm sure uh, you'll be, uh, you know, will be no surprise to you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, things around uh, tradition, uh, Mary, the Pope, yep. um, mm -hmm. those, those kinds of things. I don't feel, were there questions in the, the thread? If not, yeah, I, I can. I think, I think we've covered a couple of them. Uh, one was, what, what do we mean by saved by grace? And I think we've, I think we've covered that to some, at least enough for now <laughs> I, I think i think we've got well, that one we um, we disagree i think what turns yeah, out well, that's, case. yeah um, that, um yeah so there's just i think let's go towards sort of the tradition aspect um hmm. if we go to this one just it might be a slightly quicker question i'm not sure so uh, are the decisions teaching the councils considered to have the authority of papal infallibility or is infallibility literally just direct teachings or morals and faith by the pope Right. Well, OK, uh, we need to define our terms here a little bit. Um, councils and papal pronouncements that are infallible are all functions of the infallibility of the church. It's not really the pope that's infallible. I mean, we do, I know we talk about papal infallibility, but popes do not ca uh, possess 
infallible abilities. Well, they are, are the means by which the Holy Spirit guides, can guide the church into defining certain truths. But that will happen on an occasional basis. So it's not so much that the Pope is infallible. Popes aren't infallible at all. It's the Holy Spirit that's infallible. And again, he uses the Pope, but also church councils as extraordinary means by which the church is brought into all truth. That's why when Christ says, you know, I will send you the help and he will bring you into all truth. We see this as happening instrumentally through those means. But actually that's those are extraordinary means. Those are not the normative means by which the church is led into all truth. The ordinary means of the of the of the infallible magisterium, in, in other words, infallible teaching authority of the church, is actually the fact that something is taught consistently enough by the bishops of the church um, for for a long enough period of time. So, for example, the reason why I believe, and this, this is essential to our disagreement over over epistemology, over how we know what we know in terms of doctrine. The reason why I believe that the, the Bible is consisted of 73 books is because the church has taught that consistently over time and made it more and more and more and more explicit uh, over time. And then, of course, eventually it was defined by the Council of Trent. But that was something which would have existed before the Council of Trent uh, or the, the Trinity. Right. OK. Christians believed in the Trinity before it was defined in the way that it was defined by the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, and to a certain extent also Chalcedon. Those are really Christological councils. They, in other words, they define the doctrine of Christ, who and what Christ is in relation to the Father and, and the Holy Spirit when it comes to the, um, the councils of Nicaea and, and Constantinople. But we believe those things beforehand, right? There was a tradition that already existed that taught those things, and we would say that was part of the inf ordinary infallible magisterium of the church. So what, we, what I want to make clear is that popes and councils exist as independent or, or related rather um, means by which the Holy Spirit guides the church into all truth infallibly, but as an extraordinary means by which that happens. Most of the church's teachings were already, you can already believe as you know, infallible teaching by virtue of the fact that they are taught consistently throughout time. So I, I would want people to move away. And I think, sadly, I think it's the fault of certain Catholic apologists who have so focused on the papacy and have so focused on uh, councils that they make their Protestant friends think that, well, actually, what we really think is that it's what the Pope teaches that is, is, is the source of... Oh, no. The source of... Belief. It's really oh, the sacred okay. tradition is the two sources of revelation. The sources of revelation... So in other words, how has God revealed himself? He's revealed himself through Holy Scripture, that which is Theonustos, and he's revealed himself by those teachings which he passed down through the apostles outside of the Holy Scriptures, one of them being the canon of Holy Scripture itself, which is a whole other thing we could go into because I think it's the disproof of Sola Scriptura, but that's, that's a whole other debate. That, so that's, those are the two sources of our salvation. Then it's not popes, it's not councils. Popes and councils are not sources of revelation. They are merely the magisterial means by which Revelation is recognized, and then from revelation, doctrine is defined and developed. So I think there's an over-egging of the pudding when it comes to people's reliance on the papacy and on councils when it comes to Catholic teaching. You know, the vast majority of Catholics throughout history never really knew who the Pope was, didn't ever hear anything from him, uh, probably could have uh, maybe heard when he, when he died or when he was elected, but that was it. The Pope is actually much less important, arguably, uh, than people think. Um, and that's why I think it's really unfortunate that people make it such a, a sort of central point of the controversy, because I don't think it's actually as central as people think it is. It's certainly important, but it's not it's not essential. Um, so, yeah, I hope that that clarifies the question that popes and councils are interrelated. They're both the extraordinary magisterium, but they are not the ordinary means by which we know what is infallible teaching from the church. The church is more than just the pope and, and councils. Cool. I think that answers it. I don't have anything on that. Um, this Callum's question has just come in that's related to, it's talking about okay. Pope, so. It's, I'll, I'll read it just when we go on to podcast. Uh, is Peter aware of the criticisms by the Eastern Orthodox that the Pope's authority has changed from first amongst equals? Hmm. What are his thoughts? Yes, I am, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a long-standing discussion between uh, Catholics and Eastern non-Catholics 
as to the status of the Pope, uh, which is that the Eastern Orthodox want to make him a primus inter pares, a first among equals, and Catholics believe that he shares, he has a particular charism which he can use, uh, not only by virtue of the fact that he can define teachings infallibly under extraordinary circumstances, but also because he has a particular jurisdictional authority um, within the life of the church. And I would say this flows from Holy Scripture. If we go to Matthew 16, 18, uh, our Lord says, um, Blessed are you, are you, Simon Barjona, because these things have been revealed to you. They say that Christ is who he said he was. He says, um, I will make you, oh, what is it? Hang on. I hate when this goes out of my head. Mm. Um, on this rock, I'll build my church. Is that yes, the one? you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you define, whatever you uh the fine earth will be bound. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Sorry, it's the evening, so clearly my brain's going. It's all good. We're, we've been going for an hour and a half. It's all <laughs> over that. So that's good. So, um, so what, what do we what do we think of that? Well, okay, I think that it's uh, it's very telling that our Lord changes Simon's name to Peter. Whenever that happens within Holy Scripture, you find that something big is happening, like Abram to Abraham, for example. But I also think that it's uh, important that he gives him the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom uh, is a reference back to Isaiah 20 verses 20 to 22. 22, sorry, verses 20 to 22. Uh, when we talk about Eliakim, who is effectively the vizier, maybe you might want to say, if in an analogous sense, the prime minister of Israel, uh, being made such uh, by having the keys of the kingdom given to him. And this is, I think, under King Hezekiah, who's a, a messianic figure, in fact. Mm -hmm. And when he's been given this authority, what does it say? He says, whatever you bind will be bound, whatever you loose will be loosed. In the authority of the king, right? So he has the keys of the king. So the king in the Old Testament, his keys are being given to Eliakim to rule in his stead over the kingdom of Israel. Well, the new king, Christ, of the kingdom of God, of the church, is giving his keys, will, will give his keys to Peter when the church is founded, uh, later on, which is after the crucifixion, or, or arguably when the when the the, uh, the lance pierces our Lord's sacred uh, most sacred heart. That's that's a whole other discussion. But anyway, um, he's giving him these keys, and what are the two authorities? He says, he says, whatever you um, the keys of the kingdom, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, that so that's a, a twofold kind of jurisdiction there. On the one hand, it would suggest that it is a magisterial authority because to bind and loose in rabbinic terminology was to actually interpret the law, to bind, in other words, your, your followers to a particular interpretation or to loose them, in other words, to, to take away a particular interpretation. So that suggests that's a magisterial teaching. You're binding people to a particular definition of truth and you have that authority. But it also suggests that it is uh, something which is a wider jurisdictional power because of the fact that this is being given um, as effectively to the prime minister of the new kingdom of God. So that all of that taken together would suggest to me that what Christ is doing right at that point in, in Christian history is establishing an office which has a magisterial teaching authority, which goes into papal infallibility, but that's a developed concept later on. But also this idea of there being a jurisdictional authority over the whole church that is unique because he gives it to Peter first before he then gives it to the rest of the apostles and gives him a particular a name and a particular a recognition as the, the the rock upon which the church is built so and with regards to the old testament context so to me that suggests that there is more going on here uh than i think eastern uh, non-catholic christians would be comfortable admitting um but again this is these are concepts which become more and more and more recognized over time so the church is brought into the form of that truth by the holy spirit so i'm i'm definitely aware that there's a disagreement between uh, catholics and and uh, eastern christians who are not catholic but um, i would say that there is very good reason for saying that actually the catholic claims particularly are credible so uh, it kind of then begs the question of how do you know that you're in the line of Peter, I guess, when, from, well, from my understanding of history, that it's not as clear cut that success, succession? <laughs> well, it seems to be, uh, if you like, determined by uh, the tradition of the church insofar as people recognize the genealogy, for want of a better term, it's not a genealogy, of course. It's not a it's not a father son relationship, but it is that there is a particular office 
uh, which has been which has received the charisms that were promised to Peter, and the founder of that office, um, the bishop, the bishop, the episcopate of Rome, is thought to be Peter himself. And and this is something you find within ecclesiastical histories. You find it within Saint Irenaeus. You find it within various different church figures who recognise Peter as the founder of the Church of Rome, along with St. Paul. It's not just St. Peter alone, by the way. St. Peter and St. Paul are both recognised as the founders of the Church of Rome uh, in distinct ways. But regardless, the authority which Peter has been given is then thought to be given to those who are elected as the Bishop of Rome um, themselves, as the principle of unity within the whole church. Now, is this always recognized perfectly? No, uh, this is definitely something which I would say is is regard is the consequence of a um, of an autosynthetic development. And what I mean by autosynthetic is that the full implications of this teaching are impact uh, are unpacked and brought out more and more over time. This is exactly what we see within the uh, church itself. So we do see very early recognition of the authority of the Bishop of Rome uniquely. Um, not just within what Saint, Ign um, Saint Clement of Rome does in his writing to, for example, the churches in Antioch. We also see it by virtue of the actions of uh, Pope Victor uh, when he tries to impose a particular view of the dating of Easter in the Quarter Decimal controversy. Now, you might say, now people will say, ah, but he was he was resisted. Uh, people disagreed mm -hmm. with his trying to impose that. Ah, yes, they did, but none of them challenged his authority to do it. They might have said it was imprudent. But that's not the same thing, or even very disagreeable and authoritarian. But they didn't say that he didn't have the right to do that kind of thing. And what you see over time more and more and more is that th those who are the Bishop of Rome, A, are the ones who are seen as having a particular authority within ecumenical councils, those extraordinary means of defining church authority. And more and more, the, the, the Pope himself is seen as having this particular authority, which is why e the Eastern churches have to say, these non-Catholic churches have to say he's a first among equals. They, they have to go at least that far. They have to recognize there is something there. It's not just, oh, he's just one patriarch amongst an, another. You know, he, he could be the bishop, of, could be the patriarch of Jerusalem, could the, be the patriarch of Alexandria. No, no, the, the patriarch of Rome, by virtue of the fact that it was founded, that his office was founded by St. Peter, and he is, he is inheriting this from St. Peter, has a unique authority than even the Eastern non-Catholics recognize. So I think that there is certainly definitely, again, more to this this than I think a lot of people are willing to recognize. Um, mm. Does that help? Yeah, I, I mean, when you're going through Church Fathers, I mean, that's just the, one of the things that I am actually quite favorable in, in towards Catholicism on that front, because I wasn't taught Church Fathers at all mm. until I started doing that uh, myself and that would be in within the last decade so as soon as you go down that road i'm like <laughs> this is this is like I'm, I'm happy to learn and hear from you and the, my comment was more from uh hearsay more than uh first-hand knowledge so i think there's something that in, in talking to, to catholics uh, roman catholics in in that sense just um there is that strength of tradition that I think, uh, and I know I've talked to Dan about it. This, this, uh, from liturgy to when you've sort of been brought up. I've, I can't say I'm non-denominational. I've been brought up in almost every denomination there is, just because my parents were missionaries, and that's you kind of went to what you could. But it was never ca Catholic, so I, I never um, experienced that. Um, so it's it's been fascinating learning this, and I think. Um, I'm just recognizing the, the time and we said we said 1 30. Um but I, I really yeah, I appreciate mean, I, that answer. Yeah, no, I mean I I thank you. And I'd I'd happily go on go on further. Maybe we can come back with specific uh, you know yeah, we'll topics like God bless lady, um <laughs> or, or things like that, which would which would sort of narrow the discussion into into mm. those areas. I would simply uh, just respond to what you just said by saying I really encourage anyone who is interested in these issues to look into what the early church fathers do say. Because I think there are two realities that we do need to be recognized to any honest observer of Christian history. One is that the early church fathers do have a certain degree of disagreement, but they certainly have a, cert a great degree of consensus. And on those things of which they talk, they, are consent they have consensus. They do have sacramentology. In other words, they do have baptismal regeneration. They do have the real presence of Christ within the Holy Eucharist. They do have what is earlier known as exomologesis, which is the confession of sins to, well, the bishop or then a priest delegated by the bishop to forgive sins on his behalf. Uh, in other words, they have all of these beliefs which are uniquely 
Catholic, and in a small C sense of the term, because they're not just things that a, a, I, a Catholic, as in a Western Catholic, would believe. Eastern Catholics, the Eastern non-Catholics would believe this, the Assyrian Church of the East, the Oriental Orthodox, all of those groups would hold to these same beliefs with regards to the instrumental causes of salvation, veneration of the saints, the veneration of our Blessed Lady. These are all things that you find very much within the tradition, and that's a very consistent tradition. But on the other hand, I think there are some Catholics who, who basically want to over-egg the pudding again by trying to say, oh, well, all of our beliefs are, are just early and can be proven from the various early sources. Well, actually, I, as a Catholic, don't think they can. I think there are plenty of, of teachings that are clearly developments, clearly things that are either, again, the unpacking of a particular teaching which we find within Holy Scripture and, and the earliest tradition, which becomes unpacked or an endosynthetic development, that is to say the synthesis of different teachings already within the deposit of faith. So, for example, saying that the um, purgatory uh, indulgences come about because Christians believe, okay, we have purgatory, that's an early belief. We have the idea of temporal punishment, that's a discernible belief. belief. We have the idea that the church has the power of the keys to forgive sins, for example, and remit sins. Uh, that's another belief. And all of these get synthesized together in, in comparing them and, and thinking of them together into the idea that, yet yeah, the church has the ability to remit temporal punishment for sins. Right? That's a later development. It's absolutely a later development, but it's an endosynthetic, as to say, a synthesis of the, the doctrines within the faith that already exist that comes about later. And the other example I would give is an exosynthetic development, which is to say it's synthesizing the truths of the faith with truths outside the faith. So in the Council of Nicaea, what do you find? You find that um, the church fathers um, of that council are willing to say, okay, no, we believe that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the way we're going to explain this when it comes to Christ and who he was is through Greek philosophical terms like homoousios, the idea that he's of one substance, usia, with the Father. Well, that's not something you're going to find in Holy Scripture. But it is something you're going to find within the Greek philosophical tradition. And in fact, the term homoousios is used by Gnostics first and then later um, adopted by, I think it's Pope Victor as well. Again, funnily enough, I, I would have to look into that. Um, but then appropriated by the church. So what is the church doing? Taking the truths of revelation. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. And then saying we're going to explain this using the truths of reason as discerned in the Greek philosophical tradition. Which again, if you're a Christian, you'd think God placed the new covenant in that particular historical context so that those truths would be appropriated and baptized by the church, which is why I never have a problem with using Greek philosophy in that way when it's been effectively canonized by the church's authority through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Or again, the real presence. You know, we talk about transubstantiation. Well, that's because an early belief, the real presence, is then explained using Greek philosophical concepts in a council of the church, in this case, in the second millennium. And so those are exosynthetic developments. So development is there, okay? Any Christian who doesn't recognize um, development, not only within the Catholic tradition, but actually in the shared tradition we all have, because I would, you know, you, you are both Trinitarians, right? You would both agree with me that we can talk about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit as God, and yet the, the Son is and the Spirit are homoousios of one substance with the Father. Well, if you agree with that, you're accepting a form of development. Um, so these truths, yes, lots of it, is early. Lots of all of this stuff of, of the Christian faith, perhaps of regeneration, the real presence, uh, the sacrifice of mass, this is all very ancient and very early. But there's also there a lot of development. And both those things are important to recognize for any of us. And it's because of those two things that I actually think that Catholic Christianity makes the most sense, not only of Holy Scripture, but also of Christian history itself. And I would encourage there for any of your listeners, any anyone, in fact, um, to look into more and more what that consistent tradition is, because I think when you look at it and find it consistently, you'll find it's Catholic. <laughs> there you go. That's that's a conclusion. No, I did like, I mean, I, I think one of the things that, like, you know, if Phil, from your experience, is that um, Protestants, I'm going to say Protestants, evangelicals, whatever you want to say, mm. um, do not, that there's don't really value tradition um mm. as they should and, and i i love reading like the d decay and and the letters of ignatius and i like the way he talked about the eucharist you know the medicine of immortality he, he calls it and um you know the church fathers are are, are, are rich I, I, I would agree with you i mean i probably push i'm not getting it now but i think there's a, a lot of disagreement i think there are often a lot of um 
assumption like uh, presumptions that are read into what the church fathers are saying rather than necessarily letting them speak for themselves sometimes mm -hmm. uh, especially in terms of real presence and things like that we met in baptism and maybe get into that next time around mm -hmm. um but but uh, yeah I, I agree with it it's definitely there uh and, and actually it's, it's interesting i think when you read ignatius how how catholic it sounds uh you know he, he does read you know um and and um i think from 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 the protestant perspective Obviously, we're you know the emphasis is on the Bible, Scripture. You know, um, you know when we talk about solo scriptura and things like that, not solo scriptura. I know, uh, mm -hmm. but you know the Bible does say. You know, and I think there's there's one passage I'll just say as a sort of finish is you know when it, in Second Thessalonians, um, you know, chapter two, verse fifteen, where it says, "So the brothers and sisters uh, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter." A lot of Christians bypass, a lot of uh, Protestants bypass that. I think actually there there is value in tradition, uh, and, and we're and we're we're called to listen to it as well. Uh, not over scripture, I would, but in 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 in, in partnership with it. Um, so yeah, um, I, mean, a lot, a lot, uh, I know Protestant apologists who would say that well, you know, two Thessalonians two fifteen, whatever the traditions were, they're exactly the same thing in the in the uh, word that they were in the letter. So in other words, that doesn't prove that traditions are there. It just proves that he <laughs> spoke these things and he wrote them down at the same time. And unfortunately, I mean, I have to say, as, as a Catholic, I don't think you can prove anything from that from that verse either way. I think it could mean either of those two things. Yeah, um, which is one of the reasons why I don't think uh, it's always possible to kind of adjudicate these issues by scripture alone. This is why I actually do think that we need to have more than just what Holy Scripture says, but I think we also need what the, the tradition does say and, and the tradition's understanding of what the tradition means is actually quite important. So that when we see the fact that, just going very briefly back to baptism, um, Christians always understand John 3, 5 as meaning, you know, John 3, 5 being uh, the, the, the oh, again, water that's <laughs> Um, that we are, um, come on, Peter, work it again, too late in the evening. John 3, 5, look it up. Titus 3, 5, again, is a parallel passage. It is referring, in other no words. No one can enter the kingdom and unless water, they're born of water. Water and the spirit, thank you. There we go. So being born again by water and the spirit, finally got there. Um, what is a consistent and universal understanding of this? It's the understanding that baptism actually does save. <laughs> so again, I didn't want to bring that back up. I just want to use that as an illustration of, it's not just about what the Holy Scriptures say, it's what the tradition understands the Holy Scriptures to be saying. And if all Christians understand this effectively throughout time, you think, well, maybe there was a point, maybe that the Holy Spirit really did guide these people into understanding that passage in that way, because that's genuinely what it means, irrespective of whatever later interpretations may come along, because people don't like that particular interpretation. So that's why I think tradition, that's one of the many reasons why I think tradition matters and why one of the basic disagreements between Catholics and Protestants that does need to be addressed is whether we take scripture alone as the sole uh, sufficient infallible rule of faith, or whether we say, actually, whilst it certainly is infallible, it's not the sole sufficient rule of faith. There are other things we need from holy from sacred tradition that do have to be brought into the mix. And once we do that, well, that's when a lot of Holy Scripture and a lot of Christian history looks rather different. It really does affect everything you then go on to think about when it comes to theological topics like we've just been discussing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why I think that particular discussion on Sola Scriptura really is fundamental because it changes literally every other discussion you have from then on in, um, including the stuff on justification, which we've been able to discuss this evening. Which has turned out to be the main focus of the evening. Um, th there's a bunch of questions in here. We, we haven't even touched on on, on Mary and uh, veneration of saints and things like that um, mm. and what was codified. There's, there's loads of very informative comments in the chat there. Guys, sorry that we can't uh, go through them all. There was one that I think was interesting. It'll be sort of an in interesting, I think it's a quick one for, for Dan and myself if I find it. Uh, where'd he go? It's gone. <laughs> uh it was basically there we go uh dan was you maybe this can be the topic of our follow-up conversation because people have been demanding another one for, uh, at some point if you're up for it um what would be your biggest objection to catholicism <laughs> dan yeah. you're, you're on mute yeah i'm back yeah. sorry about you're that back. Uh, amateur mistake uh yeah i mean <laughs> I, I, I go back to i think um the the trent horn book is that i'm in so much agreement like like with the you know i like reading the the roman catholic catechism 
uh i i um you know i think there's there's a, there's a lot of great stuff in there and i think when i go reading trent horn's book is as i said about the first third i'm like yeah we agree we you know we believe in the uh the the, the trinitarian god has revealed himself to us uh through through christ and uh and his incarnation and his, his birth life death resurrection um and um you know we're all on the same page and i think it's just it's it's and then there's the next things uh, it, it, it's a culmination of lots of little things i think there's not like one big thing like i even when we talk about justification like i'm not a hundred percent you know like i'm not that's what i say when I, I i don't like to think think of myself i've never thought of myself as a protestant because i've never positioned myself or understood myself to be against the Rome, roman catholicism i want to understand it uh and and if I'm wrong, then I'll change. I'll change my mind. Um, but I, the way I've been brought into the Christian faith is through, you know, uh, the Protestant tradition mm. um, or evangelical, you know, charismatic. It's not. It's not. It's not Protestant, really, in 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 the, in the strong sense. Mm. And so I, I think I find a lot of I'm uncomfortable. Doesn't mean it's not true. There's a lot of stuff about Roman Catholicism that I'm uncomfortable with. Or, or that I don't necessarily know enough about as well to, to kind of give a, a competent, you know, uh, historical sort of justification one against it. But I say it's, it's lots of little things that make me uncomfortable. You know, when you talk about Mary, I know you don't worship Mary, but veneration of Mary, uh, about praying to mm -hmm. saints, uh, about purgatory, mm -hmm. about um, the the canon and other books in the in the in the Roman Catholic uh, canon that differ from uh, from from Protestants, um, you know. So it's a it's it's uh, the Pope. Uh, there's 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 just all these little things. It's not that there's one thing, but there's just lots of little things that, I'd have, that we'd have to have a, a lot more time, I think, to to kind of explore in greater detail. And I think because I'm through that Protestant tradition, my my default is what does scripture say you know so if you can show me from scripture and i know that's not i know it's more complicated than that but i i have this innate discomfort with uh with with claims uh that are not don't seem obviously rooted in scripture to me hmm. uh and i, and I you know when we talk about you know all, all sorts of things it's like i can understand them so when we talk about um you know um priestly celibacy okay we don't need to get it now but i can understand so i'm like i can understand well yeah paul does say you know there uh, alludes to, to this but then there's this sort of thing that's been built around it so it seems to become much bigger than what it uh, appears and one thing it's sort of optional but now it's mandatory you know all sorts of things i don't want to i've got all sorts of little things so we maybe we can natter about it next time but yeah in yeah. answer to the question there's no there's no one big thing i would say uh because i'm I, I see myself as a seeker of truth and uh, and uh I, you know if if roman catholicism is the case then i'll then i want to embrace it if it's not uh but i think it's it's lots of little things that end up becoming a bigger thing that, that are a, an obstacle for me hmm. yeah I, I think i'm similar i think a lot of, a lot of i see a, i've seen a lot of anti-protestism uh, not anti-catholicism <laughs> And I know most of that is a caricature. And so my interactions with uh, Catholics have actually been fairly minimal from a one-to-one. -one. So this sort of thing has really been fascinating and hearing coherent answers going, oh, okay, this is this is interesting. I'm, I'm still not there. <laughs> but like, uh, like Dan, there's, there's little things that I think we'll, we'll quite happily have other conversations and I can see there's so much that we do agree with the importance of Christ and there's things that I'm learning in the sense that the Mary is important and Protestants don't pay any attention to her and it's and it's things like that that I'm going okay there's things we can definitely work on as Protestants and and get a bit better at and yeah there's also a, a little bit of um just intrigue on, on liturgy especially when yeah, I know evangelicalism can, has its <laughs> own little culture with, with certain things that you sometimes, I just need something, give me what to pray. <laughs> I could go for it. Uh, we, we've got our own liturgies as evangelicals, we just don't call them that. Anyway, so yeah, there's a few there's a few things. Um, and uh, Robert, in the chat, Icon Veneration and Immaculate Conception, I think there's a, there's a couple things in there that I'd probably... I just need more information on and uh, maybe at some point we can bring those up in part two with Peter D. Williams.
Well, that would be awesome. <laughs> I would be I would be honoured to be invited back. I would love to talk about our Blessed Lady and the truths regarding her because I think that scripturally as well as traditionally they are wonderful. Um, so I'm I'm an unapologetic marriage duel. That's say a, a <laughs> song who gives veneration to our Blessed Lady. I think that's one of the beauties of the say, the Christian tradition. Uh, so I'd love to discuss that. Uh, but like I say, I mean I commend both of you for being searchers after truth. I am as well. I always want to hold my fellow Catholics to a higher standard as to knowing what, what Protestants believe so as to better understand that. Because um, it's very easy for anyone to go into caricature or, you know, just a, an antipathetic, you know, uh, straw man rather than actually knowing what people genuinely believe and addressing it properly. Because apart from anything else, look, if you genuinely do think that what you believe is the truth, uh, then you should want to present that to people. And if in order to do that, you need to critique what they believe, then it behoves you to know what they think. Um, and therefore, it behoves all of us to honestly have a very good understanding of what each other thinks and have a very honest discussion as to what, where the dividing lines really are and then also be able to kind of take them apart. Because, again, these things matter. They are discussions as far as I'm concerned, and I've described already why. Um, these are discussions within brothers and sisters, between brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. But the implications of them are very serious. And one of the reasons why I want to present them is because I, I do want both of you to come to the fullness of that truth, to have actually, uh, ironically enough, a greater security in your own salvation by virtue of <laughs> the means of grace, uh, because I love both of you and I want both of you as my brothers to come to that. But also because I genuinely believe that it's it's the duty of all of us to present the fullness mm. of that truth and let the Holy Spirit do the work of calling the, full, the fullness of his elect into his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And that is, is what seeking after truth really should be uh, the, the, the purpose of. Agreed. Awesome. Last, last very last question is about books or resources or like top couple of thing books that you'd want our audience or us to, to engage with. Well, wow. Okay. Where do you start? Um, it's, it's, <laughs> If you want to impress the Protestants, just say the Bible. I was going to say, Holy Scripture is a. I was going to say was, would be the first bit, but uh, I'd also say then yes, the early Church Fathers. Uh, but that will take you a while. Um, I think there are there are plenty of, of great books that are that are out there. But Trent Horn, you've already rec recommended. I think Trent Horn's probably Good book. the foremost uh, of uh, of popular Catholic apologists today. I genuinely think he's he's, he's brilliant, brilliant man. Um, I would recommend a lot of the discussions that you'll find on Pints of Aquinas, um, which is mm -hmm. by another YouTuber um, called Matt Frad. Uh, he does lots of lots of stuff there, and you'll like the if you're English, you'll like the title. British, you'll like the title. Um, he's actually an Aussie, but um, yeah, no, there there are, there are really good resources out there, um, but nothing substitutes for finding good secondary sources. Um, Ludwig Ott is an obvious one, it's a classic, he, he's, he wrote a book called Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma which does a very good job of explaining Catholic teaching um, in great detail. Um, it's not, I mean, it, it's very detailed so you have to really want to go into that level of detail but at the same time it's not detailed enough in certain areas uh, in my opinion. Uh, I actually think there needs to be a modern version of it. So I'd love to recommend something which would be an easy go-to um, but I, I think there are too many good sources out there that, that rather than just one. Um, so yeah, that's what I that's what I think of off the top of my head. I would say yeah, Matt Frad. I'd go with Trent Horn. Uh, they'll give you very very good in explanations. Um, and then I say I'd say watch um, the debates that I've had with James L. White. Uh, that they are quite good. I'd like to think maybe I'm not I'm doing myself too much of a service here, but I like to think that they are quite good explanations of some of the disagreements between well myself and a Calvinist anyway. I mean, mm. all Calvinists. Um, so yeah, and I'm He's a proper, to... proper proper Calvinist, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 you say that. I mean, Presbyterians would say he isn't a Calvinist at all because he's not a he's not a Presbyterian. Um, so, <laughs> sort of them. Um, he's, a, he's a particular Baptist would be the would be the phrase historically. Yeah, that's, that's probably. But he certainly does believe in the Calvinist schema of salvation. And he's a very mm -hmm. good representative of that. As again, uh, Doug, I, my my fellow Catholics, I would I'd recommend watching him and Doug Wilson in particular and Carl Truman for the best kind of re reformed thinkers out there. Uh, very good, interesting thinkers, uh, very informed uh, with us on social issues and life issues. Um, so there are lots of really good people to to engage with. And what I'm hoping to do is is actually set up my own YouTube channel to engage with these 
people more. Um, in particular, I mean, Jordan Cooper is a representative of the Lutheran tradition, uh, is a very good example of his thoughts. And if you want, hey, if you want to see a Protestant presentation of baptism regeneration, he's the guy to go see. Uh, so there's there's loads of people out there who are doing a very good job of explaining clearly. And I'm not saying I'm, I would agree with everything they say. By no means would I say that. I don't agree with everything that other Catholics say. And like I said earlier, I think there are some Catholic apologists who who try to over-egg the pudding in trying mm -hmm. to insist that things are, are more early than they actually are or things like that. Over-egging the pudding on the papacy, you know, it, which is not surviving the Francis papacy, quite frankly. Um, there are lots of examples of this sort of thing. And um, so I think just look, read and and, and think openly, um, and but but test everything, because nobody nobody truly speaking is infallible apart from the Holy Spirit, and if you prayerfully work through the the, the primary sources and prayerfully work through the secondary sources in light of those, then and and say to the Holy Spirit, just, I want please bring me into all truth by your grace. Then I think that He will. Um, and, the, and I certainly think that he will bring his elect into the fullness of that communion, um, which I hope he will enter into um, in the future. So, but like I say, that's that's worth several several more um, conversations. Absolutely. Well, what, what we'll awesome. do, we'll get you back, and we'll just fire random uh, <laughs> anti-Catholic like questions at you. You know, we'll just. Why, we'll just... why is the Pope? Why is the Pope the beast? Oh, that one comes up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll, 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 we'll just. But even what? even that, like silly silly ones and silly ones and serious silly ones, because because it'd be good to talk about Mary, as I said. And I've yeah, I've had to delete shared YouTubes in our in our group before, where they've been very much like the Pope is the beast and and things like that, and they don't last long in our group, fortunately. But uh, yeah. Anyway, that's, yeah, that's, the less, that's the less helpful end of the discussion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go down that route. <laughs> it's just unfortunate they those videos exist. Um, thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure talking to you and thank hearing you. your answers. And we'll continue this again, I'm sure. Uh, I'll close yeah. up the stream. So a little bit of a spiel. So the next conversation we've got is with Dr. Ian Paul in a couple of weeks. Uh, his website is, uh, maybe Peter can help me with the Greek, P.S. E P H P H I Z O Savizo Pavitso Pavitso. I, I don't know what it means. I should probably look that up. But he's um, we're going to be talking about Revelation, uh, yeah. and uh, he's got a commentary on Revelation, and uh, he knows his stuff. So we're going to be talking about that and whether or not the vaccine is the mark of the beast. Maybe that will come up. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, we'll, we'll have a bit of a chat with him. Uh, otherwise. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see and have heard, then please do share it. Uh, we're gradually growing up in, in, in subscribers, but um, we're doing it because we enjoy these conversations. Um, and uh, thank you for all your kind comments. Bless you all. And we'll leave it there. Have a very good rest of your night. See you later. <laughs>